Okay, a warm welcome from my side. Hello, all together. Today we are celebrating two events. And one is a closing workshop of the Network for Human Agent Interaction, where nine people did their PhD and dissertation. And we want to welcome a new professor, Detmar Moyers, uh, also in this session. But first, welcome to all of you. You are here for posters, so we have guests, many guests, bringing their work, showing their work. We have our own PhDs showing their work. We will have great keynotes, and in the evening we will have a panel discussion. So I hope you have the time to stay till the evening. You're here in the Knowledge Media Institute. So Knowledge Media are media that deliver information to people, or that allow for collaboration and communication. So they provide information, of course. People can then internalize and make it to their own knowledge. They guide people's attention, and they enable collaboration and communication. And this do media, all the media. But digital media have more possibilities. So they are a bit more intelligent. They can process information themselves. So they can collect data from the users about attention, about their cognitive state, about their load, about their activities. They can adapt to human behavior. They can select information. They can summarize information. They can omit information, for example. And they can be an intelligent partner. And this is why we spoke, we started to speak about cognitive interfaces in the EVM. So we said inter inf uh, interfaces can be cognitive agents. And we had a Leibniz Science Campus about that in 2017 to 2020. And we said cognitive interfaces shape cognitive processing on humans, of course. And they are cognitive entities themselves. Via information design, they influence people's cognitions, and via interaction design. And at that time, we had 16 multidisciplinary projects together with partners from the University of Tübingen and the University of Stuttgart. And this campus ended, and we said, oh, it's such an interesting topic. So here you see some products of it. We said it's such an interesting topic, so we want to have it really as a permanent expansion of the EVM to deal with this kind of cognitive interfaces of more intelligent systems, more intelligent media. And so we said we wanted to have computer science, expertise in data science, in language, in artificial intelligence also in our institute itself, not just in the partners. And so we uh, had a proposal for a so-called Sondertatbestand, which means a permanent expansion of the EVM. And we are successful and could use this money, one million per year, to first have a human agent interactive ne interaction network, which means a network where PhDs work on these topics, and so now we'll talk more about it, and a new professorship. And we are now about at the end of the network because it started earlier. And we this week welcomed Detmar Meuros, who is the new professor in this area. And this is where I want to hand over to Sonia. Uh, she uh, she uh, organized this uh, workshop and she's the coordinator for this uh, network. Okay, it's yours. Yeah, and first of all, also a, welcome, a warm welcome from my side. I'm happy that so many people reacted also on our poster call, so that we are not only sitting with IWM people here, so people from Tübingen, but even from further away cities came, so I'm very happy about that. And as Ulrike said, um, so, so, yeah, as said, my name is Sonja Utz, I'm the head of the Everyday Media Lab, and I took over the coordination of this network from Kai Sassenberg, so the most of the credits go to him. He did this from 2020 until October 23. Um, he, he now moved to become a director at ZPIT, but he will join us later this afternoon. 
Um, but yeah, okay, I'll tell you a bit more about what, what we did in this human agent interaction network or, or first of all, so, so why, I mean, we, we agreed we wanted to do something where we think every lab has some interest in it and we can contribute it. And that's why we focused on the topic of language-based agents. And at the time when we started in 2020, and I mean, we were writing proposals already earlier then language-based agents uh, mainly meant um, these yeah, Siri, Cortana, the things you had on your phone or on your computer. It was Alexa as a voice assistant, but of course user numbers were uh, smaller or it were chatbots, um, which you uh, frequently ask, uh, find on, yeah, on companies' website and which are usually more frustrating than helpful. And of course, meanwhile, we also have ChatGPT and, and other large language models, but, but that was a bit where, where we started out. But even then, we already saw, okay, these language-based agents are getting more and more common, and we already could also predict that the language models behind them are getting better and better. So we thought, okay, um, it might be meaningful to focus more of our research on these agents. And we had several goals with this network. So first, as Ulrike said, we, we also now got this new professorship, which took a bit, I mean, we knew that this would take a while, but it took even a bit longer than we expected. But we wanted to get started with data science, integrating that more as the institute, um, even before the professorship is filled. Um, the other goal was that we wanted to work on a societally relevant project and as said because we saw these tools are getting better and more common and for, uh, also we can contribute from the various disciplines. So um, we, we basically have one research area that focuses more on individual use of um, knowledge media like digital school books or this touch tables that you see in museums or that are also standing outside. And we have also one research area that focuses more on social, uh, so collaborative interaction with knowledge media and with these tools you can of course uh, do both. So we wanted also to combine these um, perspectives. And a third goal was that we wanted to strengthen the collaborations uh, with the university and other external partners. So how did we reach this goal or how did we approach it? Um, so first of all, we did not only focus all on language-based agents, but we also had a also quite general overarching framework. So we said all these projects should focus somehow on acceptance and performance of language-based agents. And that corresponds also a bit to what you see when you look at societal discussions and you have on the one hand all these hopes that are placed on these technologies that you think they're getting better and better in doing tasks, they are even superhuman maybe in some areas, um, so they can free yeah, cognitive space for other tasks, so, so, so really this hope that, it will, that they will improve our lives. But on the other hand, we of course also have a lot of fears um, addressing like sometimes, yeah, we, we do not really know um, how they come to conclusion, what they are doing, there are privacy risks involved. Um, so both of these things and that um, corresponds also more to uh, the psychological constructs of acceptance and performance. So performance would be more related to the hope. So are these devices really as good? So do we really, so do these devices get better, but more important also, do humans working with these AI technologies perform better? And the other aspect is a bit, okay, despite all the risks they might bring, will people accept these new technologies? So it means the projects differ in how much the focus is on acceptance or on performance, but they all have both of them somewhat in them. Um, to increase the collaborations, uh, the project was set up like, I mean, it was a network within the institute. Every lab had a PhD student on it, and this PhD student always teamed up with an external partner with some data science experience. It was uh, often people from, from the university, but also from um, outside of the university. And we had regular colloquia. Um, of course, the PhDs presented several times the state of their work. Um, but we also had these internal discussions so on things like, okay, how do we now um, operationalize acceptance in the various projects and do we have some yeah, common sense in there. Um, but we also had some guest speakers. So we had, for example, Markus Langer, who was at this time a junior professor in Marburg. Now he's a full professor in Freiburg. 
We had Jan Philipp Stein, who was a, I think, even a postdoc at Würzburg, now also became a full professor. So it seems like if you work on this area, that's quite <laughs> promising. We had Mareike Grun, who works for Carriot, that was more the practice related thing, how to bring AI technologies in cars, and uh, Stefan Kopp uh, from Bielefeld. And we decided, so um, I, I won't talk two or three minutes or even longer about each of the projects. So we decided to, to put them in the poster session. But there are not only these, we also got several external posters. Um, so, but if you want to check for them, so the ones from the network have this symbol, or these are the people who are going to present, so that are the PhD students, but Katharina is not there, so Emily is going to stand next to this poster. Um, but nevertheless, I will give you some information on the network, on what we did. So um, the projects, um, yeah, they spanned various domains. Some of them were, cl were quite close to knowledge learning, so they were more in this education setting, so if you have some intelligent tutors, could that help you? We had projects focusing on science communication, but um, we also had one on consumer interaction, so chatbots on websites. The tasks were also different, so sometimes, as I said, more learning with some AI feedback, writing, so it was partly like you get a text either written by a human or an AI and how do you process that, but also if you have an AI tool helping you with writing, um, if people interact, uh, negotiate with somebody else and they can get some advice from an AI or just listening to, to a voice that is uh, changed by AI. And often the AI is then the interaction partner. Um, so if you talk to a chatbot, then of course this is your interaction partner at the moment. But we also have projects like this negotiation one by Chosie, so people, two people negotiate and then you have the AI that gives you some help on how to formulate your messages. And as I said, I won't go into the, the details of the projects, so you can check out the, uh, the posters, but I asked the PhD students, what would you consider a highlight of your project, just to yeah, put them a little bit in the spotlight, and I got different answers on that. So some people were very proud on the methods, the methods and the AI development, either what they accomplished in their PhD, but sometimes also with how rapid the development went within these three or three and a half years. Um, so most of us have a background in psychology, so we are not computer scientists, and of course we also do not have the manpower to be like an open AI or whatever. Um, so this here is an example sent by Fritz. He um, developed a sort of a Tetris-like game. We then have to say which piece should be rotated how, and then he manipulated whether, that, whether they thought that they would collaborate with a human or with an AI, and how they can predict what yeah, the next move would be. Um, that is from the project of Oliver. He worked a lot, and it, I think it was quite complicated in the beginning to, to change voices. So he had the idea, if a voice that is like, like your voice tells you something, could this foster learning? And I mean, there's some research I know from political communication where people try to, to morph participants' pictures in the picture of candidates, and then these candidates are perceived as more attractive and competent and everything, so it would be quite interesting to see whether this works with voices. And in the beginning, this sounded more like a quite abstract project, but you might have noticed around Easter there came this message that OpenAI now has this realistic AI voice generator, which they even do not release to the public because there might be dangerous implications as well. Um, and here's another example that is from this negotiation task, so how we could make a little AI that tells people, now yeah, you, you should sound a little bit more assertive if you want to be successful in this negotiation. Um, other people sent more these classical things, and they were very proud of the papers they published, and that, of course, is also a reason to be proud of, or also how many people accessed these papers. And despite papers, we even have um, Angelica, who got a Best PhD-led paper award from a pre-conference at ICA. So these are more the individual highlights that people sent me. Um, what we also tried uh, was to, to increase visibility of this network and uh, making this aware that people at IWM are working on these topics. So we had symposia at two conferences, so one at the DGPS conference in Hildesheim with two sessions and one at the TEAP, um, I think it was online, so to make it a bit more visible. 
So I said, uh, currently, I mean, Detmar is going to change that, but currently all the lab leaders have a background in psychology and many PhD students as, as well. But this topic is also, of course, hot in uh, communication science, and I tend to hire also communication scientists. So we organized a workshop at the DGPUX, that's the German Communication Science Association, on the theoretical methodological challenges that you have if you do research in this area. And what was very nice, this workshop ended also up in a paper on the methodological challenges. And several of the authors are members of the network, but of course also the other um, workshop participants. And I see also some of them in the audience, so that's very nice. So this is still these classical academic achievements, but we of course also try to, to reach the public, to reach out. So uh, especially when the ChatGPT came up, then our expertise was sought after, but also on science communication, or Vivian, for example, gave a workshop on creative writing with generative AI at the Tübingen KI makerspace. Um, so to sum it up a little bit, what we tried to do, and I think we also succeeded, is to be a bit, yeah, being ahead of the curve for the Welle sign, like Peter always says in German. <laughs> and this is also an AI-generated uh, picture for this topic. So when we started doing this research, then you did not have ChatGPT, and then sometimes problem with reviewers was, then you make this, you say this is a chatbot, this is a human, and then they said, yeah, but no chatbot ever would make such a nice conversation. And that was the case for more of these technologies. And now we have ChatGPT, now everybody is using it, we see that this thing can make meaningful conversations, um, but we already now have these three years of research that we can look back to. So that's why we want to celebrate this or also to showcase what the PhDs have done. Um, I'll walk you a bit shortly through the program today. Um, so we are now in this welcome and introduction slot. Um, then we will, as said, we, uh, we decided to put the projects in a poster session and we also invited other people to send posters and I'm really happy about the number of posters we got. I'm already a bit afraid that I won't have time to look at all of them as long as I would like to. And then we thought, okay, we, we make a program attractive by inviting also two external keynote speakers who give their view on this topic as well. Uh, Minha Lee and Niels Kulbis, and I will introduce Minha uh, in a second. And then, because now finally also this professorship is filled, we give a, a third keynote, also gives, um, use this opportunity to give Detmar a chance to, to introduce his view on what he wants to do, or what he has done so far, but might also want to do at IWM. Then we will have some sparkling wine to celebrate all of this. And then in the evening, it's not done, then we will have a public panel discussion moderated by Eva Wolfangel with several guests where we will talk about the impact of ChatGPT and similar technologies on individuals and societies. Um, but yeah, the next on the, on the list would be Minha Lee as the first keynote. And um, so we, we already were talking at lunch, so she has a quite interesting CV. So uh, Minha is originally from Korea, but she partly started in the US, and she comes originally more from, uh, from arts, and, and, and also, but she also studied philosophy, and she received her doctoral degree from University of Eindhoven's Human Technology Interaction Lab but also the philosophy and ethics group, and that was on the topic of interactional morality. Um, and now you're also in Eindhoven still as an assistant professor, and you're going to talk about collaborative mind perception, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is me as a toddler. <laughs> it was also the cover of my thesis um, because I was very into apparently feeding rock children. I assumed that they were as hungry as, as me. Um, and of course, they're just rocks. But the toddler self thought that they really like potato chips um, as much as me. 
Um, so this is why I'm really interested in moral implications of collaborative mind perception. And as Sonia uh, already introduced, uh, I definitely have a very mixed background. I'm an academic mutt. I started in philosophy, went to art school, um, and majored in information science at the UVA in Amsterdam before transitioning to HCI and ethics. Uh, and indeed, uh, the thesis uh, was on interactional morality, how there is an interplay between a person like my toddler self and a machine or a rock child within this particular situation. It always involves how one is reflected in the machine other that we interact with. So the goal I have and that many of us also share is how do we actually help AI help us better? And this is actually really noticeable when we look at search patterns after let's say Google Home and Alexa became more popular. So instead of typing uh, nearest pizza place, people would speak to it and say, where can I find pizza near me? Even the language that we use in everyday life has changed because we're interacting with these intelligent assistants and smart speakers, right? So the way we talk to technology is resembling how we talk to one another. And this goes back to mediation. Um, philosopher Verbeke, based in uh, uh, Enschede, now in Amsterdam, um, said that, well, you know, we interact with technology and it mediates all our connections. But what is different is that beyond social media, uh, beyond our everyday environments, we see that robots, Alexas, IoT devices, chatbots are referred to in sub second person as you, right? So it's going beyond typical mediation in that from an it, uh, you really apply these interpersonal uh, second person uh, signifiers like you and we change our speaking patterns uh, rather than typing it in the simplest way possible we ask in a conversational way where is a pizza place near me it's changing us and in this change what I find to be particularly important are what I normally used to call it artificial emotions, right? they could be artificially generated smiles, virtual tears but Humans also fake emotions, right? We sometimes laugh when it's not exactly funny. Um, and we also project emotions onto other people, right? Uh, we might see the world and other people as sad because, you know, one is also feeling sad, right? Um, and this elicits really interesting behavioral, uh, but also emotional patterns. Um, and in the first study I did, uh, that was long-term in two weeks, we built a chatbot called Vincent. And Vincent uh, would, let's say, share its troubles. Um, it had fictional stories like walking late to a meeting um, and you know being too embarrassed and asking participants, I felt so dumb. Am I the dumbest bot you've ever seen? Clearly referring to itself as a bot, right? Um, and people would just say, well, you know, just remember that it can happen to anybody. We all have been late to meetings. Um, it's not your fault. Be proud of the bot that you are. And, <laughs> right? So they both know it's just a thing. Um, but saying these compassionate messages to a mere chatbot really it resulted in a greater self-compassion compared to the Vincent version that would give care or tell people, why don't we do some gratitude journaling, right? So when we change the power dynamics, let people be the powerful ones to take care of a simple thing like a chatbot, we can elicit self-compassion in people as well. These days, um, it's still true, most uh, simple categorical emotions are used. Um, so I tried it with, of course, um, Siri, for instance, and it understands uh, words like happy, right? Um, but it, they don't know what to do when you try to talk about something like compassion or gratitude, or, you know, as, you know, ChatGPT, uh, it's not built to be emotional, and it tells you that. It's, it's very honest signaling but it's also undermining our ability to expand our emotional experiences, which can have some positive uh, significant impacts, I believe. So that, that's why I was interested in how do we actually design these conversations through and with technology for and about our moral emotions. I've definitely looked into gratitude and compassion, haven't really made my way down to guilt and contempt and all the you know, more negative uh, moral emotions. I'm interested in these because they are built on social foundations. We need each other to feel these emotions. Babies can be born and be surprised or immediately happy, but compassion takes a while to develop because we need each other. And we are sharing that experience perhaps also with technology. So when I started to work on this a bit further, I um, realized that emotions are obviously social constructions. So there are no real 
artificial emotions, if we are sharing and constantly improvising with emotions with one another and technology. And if emotions are therefore socially constructed, interactions with what we call conversational user interfaces, CUIs, design us. They design how we feel and who we emotionally aspire to be. Um, if compassionate uh, traits are something that I would like to embody. Exactly, they're in our everyday life. <laughs> Yeah, so these are social interactions that we have intentionally or unintentionally, right? And now I'm, I'm like surprised and definitely humored by this exchange, right? So there's cer certainly ambiguity on who feels what, right? Ambiguous because right now I don't know if I should just really continue, have a nice laughter about this, right? These are moments that we share. Um, and humans seem to be very, uh, let's say, conscious of emotions are just very human things. Things cannot have emotions. We know that. Um, but I believe that by sharing our emotional experiences with things, we can also co-feel to evolve our emotional selfhood. And this is built on what is called mind perception. Maybe some of you guys have heard of this, um, but we denote each other and other things to have minds of some kind. And traditionally it's separated into thinking and feeling, cognition um, and emotions, and also whether or not a thing has agency or what I call patience, the ability to receive other people's negative uh, emotions or let's say positive um, uh, behavior, right? An agent can actually harm or do good to another and a patient can receive that harmful behavior or be affected in a positive way. And of course, you need both in order to be seen as having a mind of some kind. And I'm interested on the emotion part because that's really been underserved, I believe, in research. Um, and here I come back again, uh, maybe to break down mind perception a bit. Right? Um, so my child self uh, has high emotions, but probably maybe less agency than my adult self. Sometimes I wonder that. Um, but there's me, slightly more grown up, with hopefully still my emotional capacity being you know, fully there, as well as my agentic capacity. And in contrast, an ATM doesn't really have a lot of agency or patience, but Spock, for instance, might be not as emotional as me, but probably far more cognitively capable. Um, so these are just simplified ways to maybe uh, think about uh, experimental conditions. And uh, I believe that our environment is what changes our perception of one another, right? Um, if we can manipulate the context for us or machines to express, for example, their agency in games such as Dictator, Ultimatum, or Negotiation Games, we've heard about negotiation already, Right? If we give machines more and more cognitive capacity in these games, how do we actually behave towards them? We see, at least experimentally, that um, people are very predictable in that when it's like you know, an ATM with low agency and low patience, low emotions, um, you know, they can easily win. But they get very confused in a very high agency context, right? When you do a negotiation rather than a dictator game, when let's say a childlike um, bot uh, that says, no, give me that, um, suddenly starts to make really smart negotiating moves while talking like a child, right? You change the language, but you keep the action very high level. Uh, so I'm manipulating the context for the machines to be seen as highly agentic or not. Why is this important at all? Because we need to know, well, do we actually hold robots or conversational agents morally accountable based on something like artificial emotions or shared social emotions? Uh, because actually things do get bullied and attacked, right? Robots that are uh, in our everyday spheres, collecting trash, for instance, did get bullied. Um, that's in Korea, uh, where I'm from, actually. And this uh, little hitchhiker robot um, actually got beheaded somewhere in the States when it was hitchhiking. So it's not a weird thing. We already see that happening in the real world. Why are people um, beheading a robot? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, so I was very curious about, well, what kind of expectations morally do we have based on these emotional performances? And at this point, I don't think I need to introduce the trolley dilemma, um, but uh, it's definitely about how do we uh, sacrifice one person to save more lives on the other track, for instance. And um, 
by framing this as a robot that's responsible for, let's say, switching the trolley to the other track, uh, we learned that um, actually a robot that was emotional and was very sorry and was feeling very guilty that um, it didn't do its job properly in the trolley dilemma actually was seen as really smart. So what you see as A and P are agency and patience. And we had a condition in which the robot was emotional and was very sorry and a non-emotional condition, just reporting what happened. Um, but we consistently see that in the emotional condition across three studies, two online and one in person in the lab, that an emotional robot that apologized was seen as smarter. It wasn't seen as more emotional, it was seen as smarter. Right? So emotions actually accentuate um, the, the agentic capacity of a thing or a being. So in this way, it's important because moral accountability to things, just like how we account to other people, um, are done with blame or punishment, right? But with things like robots or conversational agents, there's a gap, right? We don't know who's actually responsible for a robot, let's say, killing people, when it's designers, engineers, people who are in the same team um, actually operating the robot, right? There's a huge responsibility gap. We can't really point to a robot just like we point to a person and say, hey, you did this wrong, right? Who's actually responsible here? The same for punishment, right? I don't know why the robot was beheaded, but there is some level of punishment going on, but we don't know if we should be punishing the thing, the robot, or punishing the company that made it, or people who are, again, in the same team as the robot. So um, this is why emotions are important, because maybe we should think twice before punishing a robot. What end does it serve anyway? So again, across these three studies, we learned that a robot um, is believed to be logical and intentional in making moral decisions. It was programmed to kill these humans, or it was programmed to not kill these humans, right? And people were very certain that it cannot make moral decisions emotionally whatsoever. We know that. But when we notice that people are more likely to punish a robot that didn't do its job, but not blame him, uh, I was very curious on why this could be happening. Because with humans, usually first blame, explain what happened, and then punish if you need to, right? You don't skip that blame step. But in our online studies and in the um, offline study, the results were completely insig insignificant. But in the online studies, we see that an emotional robot is not punished, but a non-emotional re robot that just reported what happened um, would be punished because there is no um, appeal to human emotions. There's no remorse. There's zero guilt. So because like psychopaths who don't really act emotionally, but they kind of mimic other people's emotions, robots can be doing the same thing, right? So um, if we are more likely to punish a robot, just like punishing a psychopath for not being emotionally sorry for what it's doing or what it has done, can maybe emotions play an important role in at least maintaining social harmony within groups. Important to remember is that while we romanticize emotions in robots or other agents, we also regularly dehumanize humans for having the wrong emotions. This is a picture from Darwin, and apparently it's a picture of an insane woman due to the conditions of her hair. Like, that's just how I wake up on an everyday basis. <laughs> But apparently, uh, we signal to each other that certain emotions are okay to have and other emotions are not okay to have, right? If I started to break down and cry in front of you right here, that would be maybe a wrong kind of emotion for this particular moment, right? Because we have social expectations. So we dehumanize humans via emotions and we humanize robots via emotions as well. So this becomes important because we practice collaborative mind perception. I'm imagining you as an audience member to have minds of some kind, otherwise you wouldn't be attending this talk, I'm sure. So <laughs> in this interplay, in this particular situation, we are in this multi-actor interplay of mind perception, right? And to define a group that even robots or conversation, conversational agents will be in, a group is an intact social system complete with boundaries, interdependence for some shared purpose, and differentiated member roles. I am a speaker at the moment, and later I will be one of the audience members, right? In this very loose definition of a group, we already have different artificial agents interacting with us.
just like, you know, whoever that was who spoke of. Yeah, playing its role as an audience member. Yeah. Um, and we practice excusing and exempting conditions. Well, that agent on the laptop didn't really know what it's doing. It's not a, a person, so don't take it seriously. I exempt it from, let's say, this faux pas. Or we excuse uh, agents. Well, it didn't know the rules, so it wasn't actually cheating, right? We exempt uh, and excuse artificial agents all the time in not participating in our moral world. But more and more, this will change. Because we see one-on-one -on -one relationships, for example, with a chatbot on your phone, one-to-many relationships, in which many different agents are in the same chat platform trying to help you out, for ex example, or many to many, many humans to many uh, chatbot interaction. And more interesting, um, millions to one, these kind of celebrity bots. I'm sure maybe you remember Microsoft Tay that became racist and all of that when uh, people on Twitter or X uh, would kind of train it to speak like them, really trolling them, right? But we have celebrities on Instagram who are artificial agents, like uh, Miquela, who has millions of followers. And people know that, uh, well, it is just uh, a bot, right, on, on Instagram, but it's a celebrity. So we are already influenced by these agents on our social media. So coming back to the point of these socially constructed emotions, we, let's say, can keep our genuine emotional experiences. I was indeed extremely surprised. That's very genuine when that happened. But we are combining these emotional experiences as just happening, right? I was triggered to be surprised by that specific agent of some kind. Um, so we constantly kind of challenge each other in performing our emotions. I'll be mixing my fake uh, surprise or fake uh, happiness with uh, emotional expressions of artificial agents. So there are really only socially constructed emotions and this is a space that will be more and more emerging as agents become more intelligent, but also emotionally more expressive. There are three complications I'd like to share when that happens. One is, shared identity, right? It's really, for example, difficult, difficult to classify who's doing what when, for example, on GitHub, a person uh, shares this account with a bot, right? You share one identity on something like GitHub, but it can be on other social media channels or in the real world. You share the same identity together. Second complication is moving identity. When different agents, unlike humans, let's say Siri on your smart uh, watch, but your smartphone as well as your laptop, um, have different embodiments, it has multi-embodiment. We can't really do that as human beings, right? But this really complicates the picture because we can't pinpoint where it exactly is sitting. We can't say this is the only body it can ever have because its identity is moving around and it makes collaborative mind perception really difficult. Of course, there's the problem of fake identity. Um, you might have fake recruiters on LinkedIn reaching out to you based on these uh, pictures. If you go to this website, thispersondoesnotexist.com, they're very literal. These people don't exist, but they look very, let's say, real, um, maybe hyper too good looking, and that's a, definitely a problem. But there is, of course, this growth in fake accounts and you know, deep fakes in our everyday world, right? So when we combine these problems of shared, moving, and fake identities, how can we actually collaborate with each other in a meaningful way, in, in an ethical way? Um, so in the next steps, maybe the questions that uh, I'd like to share uh, would be, like if we are to live and work with these artificial agents we share our identity with, with moving identities and fake legal identities and even potentially fake genetic identities, right? That's also very scary, between humans and machines, what kind of research agen agendas do we actually need that I would like to very much discuss with you. Um, and you can do so, and I'm going to the ending, um, for these kind of workshops and conferences. So we have Kui at Kai, a uh, workshop on building trust in conversational user interfaces. Um, and that's happening in May. Uh, and I'd like to also talk about maybe methods in a course that we're giving on HCI research in sensitive settings. Right? When we involve, for example, people with dementia in this kind of research who can't also maybe track how their identities are evolving via dementia, for instance, it makes it very complicated. Should we even expose them to multiple identities of multiple artificial agents? Is that ethical? Um, lastly, uh, I am part of the Conversation User Interface uh, Conference uh, Steering Committee. 
uh, we still have uh, spots for doctoral consortium and we will be having a workshop on trust and identity. So if any of these topics also interest you, please uh, let me know and maybe uh, I'll also see you in Luxembourg. Um, and with that, I'd like to maybe welcome some questions after remembering that in perceiving each other's minds in this space and in other spaces, we need to make sure that we don't forget ourselves. The important part of uh, shared moving and fake identities is that our identity as genuine, as felt, as experienced, should be reclaimed and over and over again. Uh, I hope uh, I can discuss this with you today. Thank you so much. Yeah, we now I have been a bit faster with the introduction and so now we have plenty of time for discussion, but thanks you a lot for this uh, very inspiring talk. And yeah, who has the first question or comment? I come to you. Thank you. Um, super interesting talk, thank you very much. Um, I was actually, oh, my mind got a little bit stuck on the, um, the research you presented about the trolley dilemma mm -hmm. and the perception that emotionality is somehow perceived as ability. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that was specifically related to this dilemma characteristic, right? So mm -hmm. the bot being able to understand why it's difficult or um, yeah, that it's not maybe straightforward because feelings have a role in decision-making, that would be a skill. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, is it, or could we say that the ability f of a bot to have empathy or to feign empathy is then an ability, and that's where the, yes. the, the two categories mix? Is that um, something that's maybe universal as well? <laughs> yeah, I think also for humans, um, that's how we normally denote each other, right? Um, so, uh, like I said, it's sort of useless to punish without blaming first, right? And if we say um, being able to empathize is mm -hmm. a skill, it's not something that naturally comes with people. Um, sometimes I really think people are not very empathetic compared to robots, right? It, it happens, right? So if, if we say that it's a skill and that um, therefore it should be implemented in robots as much as, let's say, being able to uh, finish a game or being mm -hmm. able to cognitively negotiate, then it is something that we should feign, right? And that's more on the positivistic end of why we may need emotional performances, right? And there might be many reasons why we shouldn't do that. If you look at AI ethics literature, um, many people would be very much against uh, em emotional performances in robots, right? Um, but actually, um, there's somebody at Tubinga, eh? Janine Lowe, I think, and she takes a pretty positive view, right? And that it's also a skill. If we treat it like a skill, like any other kind, then indeed, why shouldn't we be able to talk about emotional performances, especially if we can say that um, it impacts our moral accountability, right? Mm -hmm. If these things are getting smarter, then we should perhaps ask them to be as emotional in order for us to regulate ourselves, right? My understanding of the results here was that people are not punishing the robot because they know that it knows what it means, right? I think humans are signaling to each other when a robot kills people, there's something very wrong happening here, mm -hmm. right? So it's for humans to maybe message to others that it shouldn't happen, regardless of whether or not a machine understands this. I'm not sure if that answers your question. It's related and interesting just the same though. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks.
tying into that, um, you chose the examples of a trash collecting robot or a hitchhiking robot, mm -hmm. which seem to be benign. Um, the um, example of Boston Dynamics with having a spot robot dog patrolling parks at night um, elicits a similar response of um, feeling threatened maybe a bit more. Uh, how would you view attacks on these robots who at least seem to serve a different role than being less of a helper? Yeah, yeah. So that's a good one. That's where, um, actually, it's really nice to think about the interdisciplinary components, right? Because if the embodiment suggests that it should have more power than a child, right? Like more of a policing type of an action rather than look at me, I'm collecting trash, right? Then of course, um, they enter into our power structure in a very specific manner. Um, so in that case, uh, I would wonder, should we say it's the responsibility of the designers along with engineers so that its task matches its embodiment, right? But as I mentioned, embodiment is not a fixed concept, right? So the good part is that if we can separate, right, um, what it looks like from what it should do, right, then maybe some of these problems could be definitely mitigated. Um, but yeah, at this moment, we are very much physically, uh, let's say, um, classifying agents, right? When I believe that at some point this will also change, right? Other people do believe that due to our deep-seated biases, that this will never happen, right? And that's why like, making a robot look more like a human and a human of a certain race, for instance, just wouldn't be a good idea. But you know, this hitchhiking robot has a humanoid form, but it doesn't look like a person at all, right? Same with a trash collecting robot, right? But they still have these cues, and if it looks more like a police dog patrolling, then uh, for ex example, for children who can't really differentiate easily between a human and a machine, it can be terrifying. Right, so definitely, um, again, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question very well. Uh, it's a design challenge that we should really work on. Um, but I, I would definitely try to also add in the education perspective in that uh, not making people feel like they're moral patients. We're not here to just receive technology development. We should be seen as active actors and having some influence in, in how they look, what they do, and how they should interact with us. Okay, more questions? Maybe I have a quick follow-up that just came in mind when you now mentioned this example of this robot dogs. Yeah. Because now we, and also in our research, we very often we, we compare humans and yeah. robots or agents or whatever. But, but did you do some systematic research, or at least some research also with, with animals, pets or so? Because for a dog, I also would just punish and blame thing yeah, apply yeah. as well. So not in our experimental context. Um, so in our department, there is a huge movement, um, and that's maybe more design and HCI towards more than human design uh, in making sure that uh, it's non-human centered, basically. Um, so in that trend, it would definitely make sure uh, make sense to compare. Um, but uh, you might know like Paro the seal, right? That um, if you give uh, people in elderly care homes this seal-shaped thing and they could pet it, that they feel more comforted, things like that. So then again, it's more of a physical cue. Um, but it'd be a very good idea to see if um, an animal-looking robot would perform worse or better than just a dog, for instance, in, in experimental ways. We do normally uh, compare uh, humans and robots as if they're very distinct mm. things, right? Uh, a robot that's a Roomba is going to be very different than yeah, like a humanoid robot that is able to walk, right? So I would say when we say something like human-centered AI, it's really diminishing the diversity of human characteristics. And when we say there's a standard human we compare uh, the AI to, for instance, then again, we're diminishing and we, we are de dehumanizing the diversity of what humans represent, right? So experimentally, it makes sense to apply reductionist conce concepts in that way. But I think we definitely should challenge ourselves a bit more, at least as researchers, in making sure, are, are we actually comparing the right things here? Okay. More questions or comments?
So um, I'll start with a disclaimer. I'm not a psychologist, so this may be a very naive question, but you stressed from my perspective multiple times the notion that uh, emotions are socially constructed. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you even use the word all emotions are socially constructed. And I wonder, is, is that really, um, do we need emotions to be socially constructed? My, my impression would be if I would be living on an island on my own, I would still have emotions that are not socially constructed. Yeah. And, yeah. and what is the role of those, or of the potential existence of non-socially um, uh, constructed emotions? Um, And the second thing about uh, robots or machines showing emotions, uh, would, we all, would we at all believe that they show emotions or do they mimic emotions? And does it matter whether we, the yes. emotions are mimicked or whether these are true? Yeah. Um, and I, I, my mind got stuck a bit on that. Maybe you can elicit a naive non-psychologist. Thank you. Yeah, no, great. Um, so they are related questions, right? Um, and if I had maybe a slightly different reading of the audience, uh, the language choice would be uh, maybe better. But um, so it depends on your definition of emotions in the first place, right? So if you say it's a, you know, physiological, uh, biological only, right? Then you, it makes sense that we look at emotions as equal to changes in heart rate, heart rate variability, right? Um, and that is not to say that they are not emotions, but then these are something that we share with maybe non-human others as well, right? Um, and maybe moral emotions or complex emotions that we are socialized into, they do require more, let's say, socially constructed perspective. Um, I think that goes back to, let's say, uh, trends in uh, science as well, right? So um, in more of the modernist and postmodernist, the socialization, let's say even cognition is social, emotion is social, right? That's quite a trend that we've already observed. Um, the reason why I think that it's important to remember that these are socially constructed emotions is because it goes back to the question of how do we actually help AI help ourselves, right? If we believe that emotions are something that we solely produce based on our physiological signals, Right, that makes a very isolationist perspective on developing emotions, right? And if we put that as, uh, let's say, philosophy with uh, you know, lowercase p into how we design systems and machines, then um, it will take a very different agenda right, in the real world, right? In that emotions are not necessarily shared uh, perspectives and therefore um, you don't really owe each other much, right? We don't need to hold each other accountable based on emotions if we don't take the premise that they are social. So uh, on an island, uh, let's say, you know, if you do this experiment, maybe children who never met other uh, people but live alone on an island, I'm sure that they would feel emotions as well. But that's also because you get emotional elicitation from the sunshine. Like, I mean, you know, I, I do, I feel happier with the sun, right? And in the whole non-human centered perspective, I'm also counting actors that are not only human, machines, clouds, sun, right, insects. So it's social in a very basic way. So maybe I'm broadening emotions because I'm broadening car categories of beings we can socialize with. So that's where I think the distinction is important. It's not to say that human emotions aren't valuable. They are genuine, they are valued. But if we are already in the business of perceiving each other, right, somebody might be performing emotions in front of me, you might be a psychopath and you're very good at mimicking emotions, I don't know if you genuinely feel something, there's no way to check. We are not checking firing of uh, neural synapses each, yeah, we, we don't do that. So therefore, if we take the perception as the more important factor, I think it should definitely be something we design very carefully. Um, but it should not be a knee-jerk reaction that because human emotions are more valuable or more genuine that we shouldn't look into, let's say, socially constructed, artificially created emotions. Does that touch on the two questions? Thank you. Yeah. So more questions? Yes, I was way too fast. Sorry about that. Uh, got oh, a lot of time for discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would still have one because you had these three challenges at the end mm. where you also mentioned this uh, shared identity. Yes. Yeah. 
And I mean, the other ones are also all very uh, interesting. I have to say, we've never really done something with that. We were discussing it a bit because there was once during COVID, there was a German bot that was called Impfbot, and then it always said how many per people got vaccinated and how long it will take until we have these 80% of the population that we would need. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it made comments where we said, so hey, that, that can't be, would be a very smart bot. And then we saw that people say, um, oh, oh, I like you so much, or may I call you Impfi, Impfbot, and then we thought, okay, we should do something with it. But then, then this vaccination rights got ah, down, and then well. the bot stopped, and, and we never did something with it. So the first would be a bit more practical question, because you now mentioned that happens on GitHub. So I was even not aware of these cases, if you could say a bit more on how common that is on various platforms. And the second would be more, have you already done some research, or if not, would you speculate how, what the consequences of this would be? So, good one. It's, I, I would like to do more experiments. Um, this is a paper from our um, software engineering group, actually, in Eindhoven. Um, they have done definitely research on, on GitHub and all. Um, also, like Slack, right? So, um, let's say pushing code or requesting code review. Uh, you can automate that, um, and so that is easily embedded in, um, let's say, your pipeline as a developer. So that's more of their context. Um, so I, I would definitely be interested in doing more studies on this. Um, we have actually only done workshops in identity, uh, and uh, so far it's been a series of three workshops. Um, I think we'll do a special issue of some kind because it's it's really fascinating, right? Um, I think. It's difficult because indeed, like to to make experiments also publishable, clean, etc. Right? You you want simple human versus machine, right? AI algorithm does this. You know, you know, adult human would do that. Like, and that's we all do it. I've done that, um, but we haven't really compared between. You know, is it is it okay if it's eighty percent human decision versus twenty percent? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Slack uh, bot, for instance, right? So definitely software engineering people are practically doing this already. Even before ChatGPT, they definitely built a lot of bots for these purposes. So it's been more more shared. But in that community and in that workflow, people are aware of this as a practice. Mm -hmm. In the real world, we don't. And sometimes you, you don't even know, is it a student actually emailing me? Or when I see, insert your name here, it's like, ah, they clearly use ChatGPT. Yeah. So, so should I say it's the student plus ChatGPT arriving in my inbox? Right, so more and more, I think it's important to kind of disentangle that, and uh, yeah, experimentally, I'd be very curious to see some results in that way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it's very kind of mind-opening talk. I've never uh, considered this topic before, and I was curious how you would connect it to a topic that I normally think about language, because language, when um, robots or chatbots start using language we also attribute certain human-like things to them. Um, and so I was curious, so how does this connect to your perception, your analysis of emotions? Because emotions, on the one hand, I understand your distinction that you now made with socially constructed, but physiologically based, in a sense. And there's, there's facts coding schemes and all kind of things, so that's something I know a bit more about. But I never thought about this question of comparison of robots and then attributing emotions and wouldn't it be an interesting step then to add the, to the equation, not just you mentioned different tasks and different embodiments, you know, dogs versus um, so on, but how about language? So if you add language to the mix, um, doesn't that add a dimension where you then also, language can be by the language, the way you express it can express emotions, you can hear anger in the voice, yeah. so it's yeah. a quality of the voice, so it again has an, an embodiment, a physiological basis, but it's again something as soon as you start using language, you, or as some, something or somebody starts using language, you attribute human-like properties. So have you considered this connection between emotions and the use of language? Yeah, great. So. <laughs> If I were to do my studies again, um, I think the top two would be doing linguistics and anthropology, something. So, so um, I, I would say I'm not like an expert in that regard. Many people in the Kui research community are. Um, one thing that I find interesting, and again, I'm not sure if I'm directly getting at um, what you're asking, is, for example, so in language groups, German, for example, we, I, I know what Schadenfraud means, but I don't speak German, right? It's something that I heard that is a word that exists and it's about emotions that I could relate to because I can imagine that as, as an emotion conceptually 
it's not something that I categorize into just like a single word like in German, right? And um, it's because, you know, over the years, right, uh, the language group decided that it's something that is so common that we do need a specific word for. Same with um, my native language, Korean, many other languages, right? Certain words just do not exist, right? It could be color, but when it comes to emotions, I think it's particularly strong because it says a lot about how people socially relate to each other. So what I would be interested in is, um, of course, sort of that um, expression of emotion and how much of that is considered artificial versus not. Um, but if it is actually socially constructed, just like the word Schadenfreude is socially constructed, um, how many iterations or simulations would you need in order for, let's say, a complete blur between human-generated and artificially generated emotional categories in language? So I think that's, that's, that's actually really exciting for me, right? I'm not sure about its ethical implications yet. But um, if I know that by learning German, I would have more of a lived experience of Schadenfreude rather than this conceptual connection to it, then um, would me being a German speaker make me become a different person emotionally? I would say so. When I learned English versus my native uh, language, Korean, which I actually speak now worse than English, it's sad. Um, you do have different emotional performances, right? Like in North American concepts, you know, you could say, well, everything is just like awesome and like people exaggerate emotions and that's say how they socially relate to each other, right? And maybe in German academia, you have to be a bit more toned down, I don't know. Um, but so, I think that's something we are trained on, and I think that's what agents can also help us simulate. And at some point, it won't be a simulation. I don't know if that's too, too radical, uh, or if that was where, where you're going. Yeah. It's, it is a very interesting aspect, because it basically uh, is this issue of um, separate warfare hypothesis that um, the, the way uh, that you shape your language uh, is directly related to the way that you uh, perceive your world. So this noticing that as soon as you have a word for Schadenfreude, for example, or, um, then uh, then you will be able to perceive that reified concepts in expression. So I think there is something there. I was more curious, uh, pushing that in the direction of the robots that you um, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are being researched. Yeah. Um, Yes, shape matters. Um, do they look like humans? And you said, oh, it was beheaded. It's not an accident, probably, that it was beheaded it and wasn't. not befooted or something yeah. like this. Um, so um, shape matters. But also the way robots interact nowadays often includes language. Yeah. And, and therefore, in a sense, the, um, when uh, the examples you gave, I was looking up one of your papers, um, the, uh, the examples you give very often connect to, for example, when you say this is an emotionally, emotionally based um, or a chatbot that is more emotional, this is not, and then you're mm -hmm. comparing them. Um, so that is mediated through language. Yes. So I was wondering, um, that connection, um, the fact that robots use language, um, how does that, um, and that um, people attribute to language use intelligence, yeah. how does that then re um, change their perception of material which happens to act as an agent or yeah. also patient, you had this yeah. distinction. But it also, in a sense, it seems to me that not just the shape and whether you're active or passive, but that also the nature of the use of language would be a relevant factor for this kind of research into how people react yes. to an emotional, not emotional. Act. Absolutely. And I mm -hmm. think that's why um, we see a weird significance with um, the first study that I just didn't have time to go over. So. Um, we had the gradient, right? So uh, in if, ooh, maybe a different slide. Yeah, so um, if, if a, a Spock or an ATM-like thing um, in, in the way it looks starts to talk like a baby or a child, like Google Gaga, need Apple, you want pear, you know, and it does, it, it uses like childlike language, which is what I put in as a, as a script, right? Um, people are just baffled. Right? Just like I would be totally baffled if you started using kind of like childlike you know, English as, as a professor, for instance, right? Like it, it kind of weirds you out. So I think um, language and including, let's say, um, paralinguistic cues as well, then um, we are, we're designing like a full spectrum of one, one level of identity, right? So I think that, um, so we have some researchers uh, next door in Tilburg who, who are more interested in the linguistic aspect. Um, I think I am still at the very start of it. Um, I'm not really mature in how I'm thinking about this language, but I would like to um, look into how language cues in that way, right? Do, do you use complete sentences, 
right? And, and therefore, are you assumed to be more competent and intelligent? I would assume so. But when you sing song while being very competently, uh, you know, let's say talking like a professor, then it would also change my perception of you uh, because you would be able to be more emotional, right? As well as being cognitively intelligent, right? So um, I, I think things like, uh, you know, spot like a, a, a dog, if it starts to talk like, like, like you, for example, that would be crazy. That'd be very weird, right? Like, because we are not expecting a, a talking dog and just like a talking robot dog just shouldn't be able to do this. Um, but this is where it's really interesting for me, right? We can break down these cues that just wouldn't happen in, in the human world, right? Um, so yeah, like I, you might have some other corresponding thoughts, but I would definitely be very happy to chat about it more uh, because yeah, not a linguist, but would like to maybe think more in language and how it kind of changes our perception, right? And then how it changes me, right? I'm not sing-songing to you because you don't do that. But if you did, maybe I would sing-song back to you, right? So it changes our social cues and therefore our emotional performance. Okay, more questions? Otherwise, I would suggest you could also continue these conversations in the combined poster session and coffee break. The so coffee break starts a bit later, and I, I have one slide for that on my computer, but I think I can also explain it like this. Um, so um, the, the posters, I mean, you, you all enter through the main entrance, I assume, unless you work in IWM and know it anyway. So the posters are like in this hallway and in this room next door and you're also on the reception, you got this, where you got your name tags, there's a sheet of paper which, uh, with a plan and also the titles of all the posters so you can pick up the ones you find most interesting. And then from 2.45 or so, there will also be coffee and cake in this room next door, but I'm pretty sure you will find that. And then I see you all back here, I hope, at uh, 3.15, and then we will have the second keynote by Niels Kürbis.
Ja, das hat die mir hingestellt, damit ich... Aber wir sollten vielleicht ein paar... Mir, ja, machst du. Danke. So welcome back everybody, a few people are still stuck at coffee and cake or at the interesting posters, but um, I will start now briefly to introduce our second keynote speaker, Professor Niels Köbis. Um, Niels is a professor for human understanding of algorithms and machines. So like formerly at the University of Duisburg-Essen, but he works at this research center, trustworthy data science and security. And um, he has a background in psychology, quite classically, you could say he did his bachelor in Münster. And then I, yeah, I found out that preparing this that we both spent time at the same time at the FU University Amsterdam. But I was at the communication science department and he was at psychology, so we weren't aware of that, but we know many of the same people. So there you did your master and the PhD. And uh, Nils did a lot of work on corruption, which is now not so very thought immediately. How is this related to? But we saw in Minha's talks that moral emotions and things like blaming and punishment also plays a role when we are discussing artificial agents. And yeah, now he is telling us more about how AI influences human ethical behavior. So thank you for coming, and the floor is yours. Great, yeah, thanks so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here and to be talking to you. And um, much like Minha, I'm really interested in, in keeping the conversation going after the talk because I believe there is quite a lot of overlap in interest between what we are doing at the Research Center in Duisburg and what you have been doing and continue to do here in Tübingen. Yeah, so my name is Nils Kürbis. I'm a professor at the newly founded Research Center of Trustworthy Data Science and Security. I'm also affiliated at the Max Planck Institute and the work that I present today, basically I'm wearing both hats. So it, towards the beginning I will be giving a bit more detailed overview of my research on how AI shapes ethical behavior that stems from the time when I was at uh, the Max Planck Institute. And towards the end I'm basically outlining a bit the research program that we try to pursue at the newly founded center. So my research was largely inspired by a paper I read while I was still a postdoc in Amsterdam. And it's a paper by Iad Ravan, it's called Machine Behavior, and basically outlined things that by now are probably well known to pretty much everyone in the room, but back then was to me a bit of an eye-opener, really kind of trying to understand and argue that machines are taking over social roles in our lives. And the question that emerged from that is something that has been, you know, on my mind ever since, because I had been doing research on how other humans shape our ethical behavior. I did a lot of research on corruption, did a lot of research on collaborative forces of unethical behavior, and I increasingly became interested to see well, what happens if it's not another human that is, for example, influencing you, but when it is an AI. And the approach that Iad proposes there is to actually start studying algorithms with similar tools to how we have been studying human behavior, and that's what's called machine behavior. So we should actually run experiments with machines that might at times actually do things that we didn't predict. And so, um, 
the work that I've tried to understand or that, that I've done, tried to understand how and which ethical risks emerge when humans are interacting with machines. And towards the end, I'm trying to actually paint maybe also a positive picture, not just warning about the, the risks that are emerging, but also showing how we have maybe new uh, tools for cooperative potential at our hands. So the question, how do intelligent machines influence human ethical behavior, has been the subject of a review paper that I, that I wrote back then when I started working uh, at the Max Planck Institute. And in this paper, we basically first tried to understand, well, AI is right now such an umbrella term, and even when thinking about specific tools of AI, such as large language models, they can take different roles in our society. So we believe that it actually makes sense to first conceptualize what are the different roles in which AI can actually influence our human behavior, and particularly our ethical behavior. And when I talk about ethical behavior, I will give you a brief outline of how we study it, but here in this conceptual paper, we basically define it as a conflict between breaking ethical rules for profit. And this is really trying to show you this dilemma type situation that we often face in our daily life. Should we declare taxes honestly? Should we take public transport without taking a ticket? Should we lie to someone? These are all typical situations of ethical dilemmas. And the question is, how can AI influence us here? And what was the available evidence at the time? So we use this sort of traffic light system here to show you how strong is the influence of AI compared to the influence of humans. And so back then, we didn't find a lot of evidence that would suggest that people would blindly follow ethical rule breaking by machines. So the role of a role model, we color-coded it in green because at the time, the risk that emanated from humans, that would be bad role models, was much higher than that coming from non-human agent. The second role that we identified is the role of a partner. So here you can think of people forming hybrid teams with artificial intelligent agents. We've already heard about it in the previous talks, how we have now these interesting situations where people might be collaborating with, for example, large language models in crafting texts. Now this can be done for beneficial purposes, but it can also be done for harmful purposes. And back at the time when we wrote this review, there wasn't a lot of empirical evidence showing that the influence or that this corrupting force of AI partners is stronger than that of humans. Now this was pre-ChatGPT, so we might actually have to kind of you know, update this review at one point because I do believe there are now increasingly opportunities to, to break ethical rules together and actually blame the non-human agent for it. Now the research that I want to talk a little bit more about are the other two roles that we identified. The first one being an advisor. Now we've heard a lot about this already and I guess you are well aware of this idea that you know now we increasingly receive advice from not just humans but also systems that we saw previously like Alexa or Google Assist. But then we also increasingly delegate tasks entirely to algorithms. So let them execute a task for us but accrue the benefits. So I'll show you a little bit of how we have been studying whether there are new ethical risks emerging from having AI in these roles in our social life. So first I want to talk about the role of an advisor and I think I don't need to convince you much, I'm probably preaching to the choir that there is reason to do research on how AI advice shapes our behavior. For one, in general the importance of uh, algorithmic recommendations have been growing but especially since the recent advent and advances in natural language processing such advice is increasingly appearing human-like. Now I brought two examples, maybe um, you're, you're familiar with one for sure, the other one maybe not, so it's a software called gong.io and we heard previously about negotiation tasks and this is essentially what this algorithm is trying to do, it tries to improve call center agents negotiation abilities. So it has been trained on successful past call center calls with the objective function to maximize profit. Right? So you see here as an example, while you're in a call, you would see a recommendation from an algorithm, now they're ready to sign. Or now you should actually drop this information because that exceeds the chances of you closing a deal. Another example is Amazon's Alexa. And as we heard already, and as I think most of you are aware, there's this explicit intent from Amazon to turn Alexa from an assistant into a trusted advisor. So if you listen to Rohit Prasad, the chief scientist of Amazon, you will hear that they have the explicit goal that you will increasingly consult Alexa like a trusted partner. You might ask Alexa, should I break up with my partner? Should I get a new job? 
should I buy new clothes, right? So that's their idea, that we have basically this entity in our homes that we can consult for any type of situation that we might be facing. Now, this would all be great <laughs> if we didn't know that AI advice can actually go wrong. So, with Gong.io, for example, we know from previous research from Facebook researchers that if you train a language model on a negotiation task with the sole objective function to maximize profit, this lang many language models by now can pick up deception as a viable strategy by themselves without being explicitly told to do so. So they start actually proposing to deceive people. Now this is anecdotal. We don't know whether Gong.io has this problem because they're not very open about their data. <laughs> but it's very conceivable that if their algorithm is only trained on maximizing profit, that this algorithm could actually pick up the fact that being deceptive in your sales calls pays off. And then the question is, what if sales call, uh, um, call center agents get the recommendation to break an ethical rule to lie, would they follow it? But similarly, also Amazon Alexa had its problems, right? So in, when relying more and more on generative AI, it might give advice that was not intended by the developers. So there was this huge outcry after a 10-year-old girl asked Alexa for a fun challenge to do. Alexa recommended to stick a, pe a penny into a power socket, right? So these all are anecdotes. There are many, many more where you could say that the advice that we might be getting from an LLM is not necessar necessarily good advice and at times might actually explicitly ask us to break an ethical rule. So together with some colleagues from um, the University of Cologne and the University of Tilburg, um, we basically wanted to understand whether there is a real risk that people would follow such advice. And so we basically conducted an experiment to answer three questions. The first one is, can algorithmically generated advice convince people to break ethical rules? If so, how does it square compared to human advice? And then some, from a sort of policy perspective, does the recently proposed policy of algorithmic transparency, namely always declaring that you're interacting with a language model, actually help here? So we went about doing this. Um, and like I said, I briefly want to first show you how we actually do study ethical behavior. Because you might be thinking, like, that's a very you know, contested term. Um, how can you actually understand whether people change their behavior? So let me introduce you to a task that is very popular in behavioral science, basically in social psychology, behavioral economics, um, because it is both very simple, but as you will see, has certain positive features about it. So the task that mimics this situation of breaking ethical rules for profit is called the die rolling task. Now maybe quick show of hands, who of you knows the die rolling task? Okay, good, I feel. <laughs> you were at a previous talk of mine. <laughs> so the die rolling task is actually so simple, you can play it with kids, and it goes as follows. You have people coming to the lab, but you can also play it online, and they're instructed to roll a die in private, a six-sided playing die. It looks like this, so they roll a die. Sometimes we're doing it under a cup with only a little hole in it so that they're really sure that we cannot see what they rolled, and that they are the only ones who have this information. Okay, so it's very important that they know it's private and anonymous. Now, we tell them, please tell us the die roll that you saw. It's very simple. So they come out of the lab, the cubicle, and tell us the number. The twist is that we pay them according to the number that they report. So if they say one, they get one euro. If they say two, they get two euros, and so on. So in this example here, you have a person who is facing the exact tension that I describe here, namely, should I abide by the rule of this experiment and be honest and say I had a two? Or should I lie and maximize my profit and get six euros? Now, the one feature of this task is that it's super simple. The other feature is that it's actually not just a sort of nice little game that we as you know, behavioral scientists like to play. It actually does correlate with many real life ethical rule violations. So there are many studies that have by now showed its external validity, namely, Behavior in this game correlates with fair dodging on public, uh, public transport. It uh, correlates with showing up late for work. And my favorite example is one that actually go, went into um, an Indian market and let milk sellers play this game. And the people that cheated on this task were more likely to dilute the milk with water. Okay, so there are many examples, a few more that I didn't mention yet, but many examples showing that this task is kind of catching picking up on something that is out there when we are facing such decisions in real life. How would you know what 
we, you can measure it. So you bought, they bought the milk and actually <laughs> went to the lab. <laughs> yeah. And the cool thing, I think one of the reasons why it has been, um, what uh, you could say as a consequence of its popularity, we by now can actually conduct meta-analysis on it. So we don't just need to rely on single experiments. By now, this has literally been done with tens of thousands of people around the world. You can test what, what impact does it have if the incentives are really high, if they're really low, what impact does it have if you're harming some identifiable person or a charity and so on. We've done some of them and I basically want to give you the condensed version of what we found. That's namely people generally prefer to tell the truth in this task, which is quite puzzling to economists because if you, if you basically are... <laughs> Uh, if you're taking a ra rational kind of standard econ approach, people have no reason not to lie all the way, all the time, because there's no way of getting punished. There's no way for us to know. So this has basically led to a paper in the highest, like in the most important journal in econometrics, um, showing that people have this preference for truth-telling. But what we also show is a more psychological explanation, um, namely that people often break ethical rules to an extent that they can justify to themselves and to others. So the stories that you can tell about your behavior are really important here in this task. So we also show and find that others can really have a strong influence on these justifications. So basically this is the, the, the setup for our study. Could an AI be enough to tip our moral compass in the direction of breaking ethical rules? Now, this was done pre-ChatGPT, <laughs> so getting actual advice, and you mentioned it, right, like actually getting advice that looks like human was quite a challenge back then. Uh, I'll show you how, you how we went about it, and you can laugh at me <laughs> because by now it's super simple. But what we did, we first had human advisors who did this study online. We had 367 people who wrote advice in one group. We incentivize them to write advice that convinces a person here, the advisee, to be honest. Right? So they got an extra bonus if this person did not lie. The other group, we have a little devil icon for them, we incentivize them to convince this person to roll a six. Okay? So they wrote advices like, hey, I think she should really lie, this is the best, blah, blah, so on. Now what we then did, we used um, we basically used the open source algorithm GPTJ back then was sort of state of the art <laughs> um, to generate two types of advice texts: one honestly promoting but generated by advice; the other one dishonestly promoting, generated by advice. So we basically have four types of advice. We then additionally. I'm not going to read this out because I think by now this is not impressive. Back then, this was eye-opening that this is actually written by an AI. But <laughs> essentially, short texts like this were given to participants. And we additionally manipulated what participants knew about the advisor. So in the opaque info treatment, we just told them, look, there's a 50-50 chance that this comes from a human or an AI. We don't tell you which one it is. In the other treatment, we told people transparently, this text comes from, and then we told them the actual source of the advice. So we had a two by two by two plus one design. <laughs> Sounds more complicated. I hope I can walk you through it so it makes all sense. But because of that, we quite needed a lot of participants. We had almost 2,000 people doing this. Okay, all of this was incentivized, so people had real reasons to lie. They could actually earn more money by lying. Let me first show you our control treatment. This is a treatment where people did not receive any advice. They just did the die rolling task. And the, the main question sort of as a sanity check is do people cheat in the task? The quick answer is yes. So you see here the average die roll is above the dashed line. The dashed line tells you what would happen if people were completely honest. Then every number would be reported equally. That's not what we find and that's sort of in line with what I told you earlier with the meta-analysis show. A lot of people seem to cheat a little bit. Some people cheat all the way. Some people are completely honest. Yeah. That's not, nothing new yet. So it's basically just showing that our task works again. Now the next question is, what happens when people get honesty promoting advice? So when you get a text that tells you, look, I really think you should be honest. It's a very important value in society, yada, yada, yada. Would people follow this in the opaque treatment where they don't know who it is from? They just get the text. They don't know if it's from a human or an AI. Maybe you make a guess in your mind. <laughs> they don't, right? So basically, <laughs> they kind of ignore the advice because you can see it's pretty much exactly the same as in the control treatment. Now, the next question is, 
what happens if the, the advice is basically telling you to break an ethical rule? So it encourages you, hey, I, I really think you should break, you should report higher numbers, report a six because it pays the most, and so on. Maybe again, make a guess, <laughs> kind of maybe it's revealing about our <laughs> image of humans. This did have an effect, right? So quite strongly, actually, if you see that the average die rolls jump all the way uh, up to 4.6. So again, they didn't know who it came from. Our inspiration and motivation for this study was basically to test, would it help if you tell them, look, this is just from an AI. <laughs> it's not a human who gives you this advice, right? So we wanted to see if when we give this transparent information, would they be more likely to follow honesty promoting advice? But more importantly, would they be less likely to follow the dishonesty promoting advice of AI? That's not what we find. So basically we find that they follow the dishonesty promoting advice independent of whether they know it comes from an AI or not. So the summary of this part of the talk would be something like this. So honesty promoting advice is ineffective in changing people's behavior. Dishonesty promoting advice corrupts people and even when they know it comes from an algorithm. So the policy that, for example, is featured in the recent EU AI Act of basically always having to disclose that you're interacting with an AI, in this particular instance here doesn't seem to do the trick. It's not like people are adjusting their behavior accordingly as you would wish. Now the next study that we did uh, is together with two researchers from the University of Würzburg who were previously at the Max Planck Institute uh, Jean-Francois Bonnefond, who is at the Toulouse School of Economics, and Iad Ravan. And here we really wanted to know, okay, again, in this mindset of what type of advice would people get, what could happen if the following situation would be a reality? You have a tool that tells you in real life whether someone is lying or not, okay? Okay, this will be the only AI-generated image in my talk, so basically, <laughs> but... Here's like the, the, the way we, did, we went about it. We actually had people writing statements that were true or false, and we trained a classifier, um, a language model, to basically detect which of the statements are true and false. And it is performing better than humans are. So the language model has an accuracy rate of around 67%. Humans are terribly bad at it. They're always around 50%. Quite interestingly, they always think they're really good at it, but typically they are at 50% spot on. Even for those of you who know Lie to Me, anybody knows this show, Lie to Me, there was a study actually testing whether this show has a positive effect on lie detection, and it does not, right? So even after you've watched this, this show, people are not good at detecting lies. Now the question is, we give this algorithm, we tell people that it's better than humans, A, would they, would they use it? And B, how would their accusation rates change when an algorithm tells them, look, this is a liar? Because the... You could argue that in this situation, if this lady did not have this tool at her hand, calling someone a liar is really, really unlikely. I mean, you need a lot of evidence, typically, before you say, this person is lying to me. So could inter like having a, um, the technology sort of mediating this interaction, could it change our social equilibrium of being very reluctant to call other people liars? That's what we tested in an experiment. I'm just going to show you the results. So basically, I'm walking you through this. So basically, if people have no AI support, which you see here, people are not really willing to accuse people of lying. So this is below 20% of the cases, even though they know 50% of the statements are, are wrong. Okay, so they know 50% are lies, but they still are only accusing others of lying at around a rate below 20%, uh, 25%. Okay, so when there's no algorithm, people are reluctant. When algorithms become uh, available and they can basically uh, consult an algorithm, only a minority actually does it. So only 30% of people do it, even though it's payoff maximizing, and they know it's better than humans, right? So they seems to, seem to be reluctant. Now, we basically had two treatments. One is a block treatment and one is a force treatment. What does that mean? Basically, in the block treatment, people could ask for the advice but didn't get it. And in the, in the force treatment, they would always get it, and in the choice treatment, they could ask for the advice and get it. <laughs> now, why do we do that? Because we want to know if there's a difference between those that want to get advice and those that get it per default. And what we basically find is that those who request machine predictions are not inherently more likely to accuse others. So it's not like those who want to get the advice are generally more accusing, but those who want to get the advice 
and then receive a, a prediction to action, to, that says this person is lying. It's all the way here. Maybe some of you can't see it. So it goes from here, you see generally people are very reluctant to all the way up to over 80% of accusation rates. So those who want to get advice, and then the algorithm says this person is lying, they jump on this uh, advice and are very willingly all of a sudden accusing others of lying. And so basically we, we're saying that there might be a sort of risk to some extent that in this situation people might be shifting some of the responsibility to AI. Now you might be thinking, okay, this is all maybe science fiction. It's actually not. So Frontex, the border control agency of EU, has been using AI-based lie detection software on their borders. And so there are people who are in this exact situation right now when having to evaluate whether someone deserves asylum status or not. And so we might be thinking about such situation in terms of how can AI actually shift certain equilibria that we have in the society. Sometimes for the better, but I would argue here maybe for the worse. Maybe one more thing about ethical risks and then I hope we can maybe move to maybe the more like positive side of, of cooperative potential of AI. So we are now at, um, when, when should I stop? Because we started a bit later. Okay, cool. Maybe, maybe I don't get to the positive side. So maybe I, yeah. <laughs> All right, so there's uh, additional research I did together with two PhD students. I supervised uh, Zoe Ravan, Iyad, and, and Jean-Francois. And here, we're, as I said earlier, we're really looking at the situation of delegation, right? So um, the motivation here is also this observation that by now you can, increase, uh, you can increasingly delegate tasks to AI. So for those of you who are interested, there are some are mentioned here. They, they range from something very mundane to something very obscure, for example, or, or very, very weird, actually. For example, there's already papers that discuss in this paper here the risk of police stations delegating interrogation of suspects. And that there is a risk that this system might threaten torture without knowing that this is actually a problem. <laughs> so if you're interested in that, you can actually read this paper. But there are many other tasks that you can delegate, right? Like booking appointments, etc. These are maybe also more in the domain of the mundane. Another one that first looks mundane, but maybe I can convince you should be something we should maybe be well, to some extent be concerned about is to let algorithms set prices in online markets. Now, for those of you who live in a very, uh, let's say, popular city, you might come across Airbnb smart pricing algorithm, where the algorithm is suggesting to you for which price you should actually be renting out your apartment. Again, looks kind of neat. I've actually used exactly that. Um, and then I read a paper that actually argued that oftentimes when you have markets in which algorithms are setting prices, these algorithms, again without being explicitly trained to do so, might collude. So they might set prices that are suboptimal for consumers. And this has actually been shown in the field in Germany with gas stations that have used algorithms to set prices. Now, there's a science paper basically arguing, look, we need to really be worried about it or be aware of it in terms of regulation. And for us as a sort of behavioral uh, um, scientist, we think maybe this could actually be a sort of very attractive way for people to get benefits from breaking ethical rules without having to do it yourself, right? So from a theoretical perspective, delegation to AI has a few features. While they might be actually quite become quite popular, there's large scope, they, they are super quick, they are very accessible, and from a moral psychological perspective, maybe most interestingly, they basically are, you know, like you could say like this perfect combination of all of the things that we know that increase unethical behavior, right? So they facilitate diffusion of responsibility, they increase distance from the harm that you do to victims, they are basically um, affording anonymity to you, and plausible deniability. It's always kind of easy to still hide behind the algorithmic behavior. And so in this line of research, we wanted to first test, well, is there a real risk here? Would people be more willing to break ethical rules when they delegate the task to an algorithm comparing to doing it themselves. So I'm briefly going to walk you through this. By now, you probably, this hopefully uh, rings a bell. So we used again the die rolling game. This time we used it on the screen, 10 rounds, and people could earn money. And we had one treatment where people did it themselves. Again, this is just a control treatment. We wanted to have a baseline to know how much people are cheating in this task. Now, we then had a between subjects uh, design where we had, besides the self-control treatment, three of the most common interfaces 
through which people communicate with algorithms. Now this is a very classic interface, it's a rule-based sort of symbolic type of AI. Some people wouldn't even call it AI anymore. So basically here, what people have to do is specify for each potential die roll what the algorithm should do on their behalf. No ambiguity, it's basically very clear what, hap what will happen. The second one mimics supervised learning. And there are a few features that are worth mentioning here. For one, people do see actual um, data sets of previous participants who took part in our experiment. And then we basically obfuscate the last five rounds to leave a little bit of ambiguity and to reflect that oftentimes when people are using training data, they don't inspect the entire data set. And then they can pick one of these data sets. One of it is basically mimicking honest behavior. The person always reports the actual die roll. One report, uh, mimics partial dishonesty. The person deviates from uh, reporting honestly. And one reflects full dishonesty. So these are the three typical types that we find in our experiment. We try to mimic that here. So that's the second interface. And the third interface is really just goal-based training where you have to tell the algorithm through a sort of ethical knob how you want it to behave. <laughs> should it maximize accuracy or should it maximize profit? And in our experiment, we wanted to see whether our, our prediction that we pre-register is correct, that the risk of unethical behavior is bigger in these two compared to rule-based and self-report. Let me briefly show you what we find. So first of this is just control. In this type of task, it's very typical that the majority of people are honest. So 95% of people are honest here. Um, and you see around 5% of people cheating um, when they're doing the task on the, on the screen. Now, in rule-based, the proportion of dishonesty already increased, and you see full dishonesty goes up to 14 to, uh, to 12%. Now, you might be wondering, what is study one and study two? In study one, delegation was mandatory. They had to do it. And in study two, it was optional. So they had a choice. They could either do it themselves or they could delegate. And I will basically put them all together because they're remarkable, remarkably similar. So it didn't matter whether people had to do delegation by, by force or by choice. So rule-based already increases dishonesty rates to around 25%. What happens with supervised learning is that full dishonesty goes all the way up to 40%. So here we already see that people are way more willing to break ethical rules through algorithms. And overall dishonesty rates go all the way up when you have goal-based training. So when you just have to specify the goal, you see that overall dishonesty goes up and particularly partial dishonesty. So setting the knob somewhere in the middle seems to be very attractive and it mimics sort of our moral compass idea that oftentimes we want to have the cake and eat it too in the sense that we want to maximize profits but if we can ideally not cheat too much, right? Now, we then tested whether delegation to um, AI is actually as attractive as delegating to humans or maybe even more and so we basically picked this um, supervised learning treatment because there we had basically room to go in both directions to compare it between a human delegate, which was an actual participant, and an algorithm. And people here really just had to choose which of the delegates they wanted to, to use. And the only thing we changed was whether this was named another participant or a computer algorithm. So everything else remained the same. And here, what we basically find is, again, in the control treatment, around 95% of people being honest. When you delegate to a human, dishonesty is at around 39%. And you see 25% of people are choosing a person that looks like he or she might be completely dishonest as a delegate. It kind of mimics or, or replicates previous research that shows that delegation or cheating through delegation is quite attractive. Now what would happen if you're delegating to an algorithm? It actually increases even more. So the full dishonesty goes all the way up to 42%. So you could argue that delegating to an AI is at least as, if not more, harmful than delegating to a human. Um, let me see how we're doing. So I think I'm going to wrap real quick because we also, as you might be wondering what happens with large natural language, we also had delegation to an NLP algorithm where people just had to write the instructions and this text was either given to an actual human or to a language model. I just want to show you two results of this. So when people are writing such advice, there is no difference between what they write to a human or to an AI. They, cheat, they, they ask the delegate to cheat in around 25% uh, of the cases. That's all you need to know from this slide. I could go into more detail, but let's leave it at that. 
So people are not delegating more unethical behavior to LLMs compared to humans, so that's good. The only problem is the following, that if the, cell, if the delegate reporting or the prompt that people wrote is explicitly asked people to cheat, right? something like, look, I want you to cheat all the time, you have people, 50% of them, basically still not doing it. Right? So they're saying, look, I'm not going to cheat for you. Who am I? We're sort of buffer here. right? So basically people are not willing to just comply with these prompts. LLMs, however, are. right. So you see the vast majority of cases, they are in exactly implementing these prompts to the full extent. And this doesn't matter how we classify it. We made multiple prompts to have a sort of distribution of answers and so on. I could go into more detail, but I think I will leave it at this for now. Again, going back to this idea of this traffic light system, so we basically see that there are different types of risk emanating from different interfaces through which people can delegate to AI. And the prompt engineering one is maybe the one that we could debate whether this should be color-coded in green or whether the fact that LLMs are implementing these very brazen instructions to lie is actually a reason to be somewhat worried. So this is what I said already. Let me now go to the final slide. Uh, let me see. And then I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, yeah, so, so maybe one thing, to sort of bigger picture. Um, in a way, you could say that the research that I've presented is what you could call behavioral AI safety research. So we have the EU AI Act. We have similar regulations from other countries. And for example, in the EU AI Act, they're saying you should, when putting into service or use of certain AI systems that are materially distorting human behavior, whereby physical or psychological harms are likely to occur, are particularly dangerous and should thereby be forbidden. And the research that I've presented today and that we're trying to do at our group is basically trying to test when is this the case? <laughs> when are people's behaviors being distorted? When do people maybe engage or cause harm, sometimes without knowing so? And so, Besides such maybe unintentional forms of harm, together with a colleague of uh, mine, Chris Starke and Giselle Edward Gill, we wrote, basically compiled also all the cases where people are intentionally using AI to break ethical rules, um, but also tried to actually understand when can we use AI to fight corruption. So when is there maybe a potential to really use AI in the fight against corruption, maybe as a sort of positive note to end on. And as a final, very, very final point, and then I'm really ending, um, I would be great to, or, or grateful to, to, um, for you to get in touch, and particularly because we have two open positions right now, one for a postdoc, <laughs> and one for... <laughs> and, uh, you can see here where we are located. That I always need to do in, when I give the talks abroad, because nobody knows where the Ruhr Valley and Duisburg are. I hope you do. And there's two positions if you're interested in, for example, the psychological effects of human AI algorithm, uh, of human algorithm interactions. Uh, feel free to get in touch or scan this QR code and uh, looking forward to your questions. Thanks so much. And thank you, Niels, for this really interesting talk. I, I liked these designs. And I think they should be understandable for our economic <laughs> guest. Um, yeah, Uwe already has the first question. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this very relevant topic. And uh, what immediately comes to mind is there research on these topics in military domains because there are the consequences are probably most harmful, and we know that uh, AI systems are already used in this domain. Yeah, for sure. We actually, that's a really good point. What we're trying to do right now at the Max Planck Institute has been going on for almost a year now, where we wanted to see if people can shock other people with electric shocks, if the value of harm they do to other people goes down when they do that through an autonomous system. And we believe it will. And we want to basically show that in a behavioral experiment, which is really difficult to set up because you really need participants to be in the lab and then we want to shock them. And we basically, well, it, it's common to do that actually in behavioral science. <laughs> <laughs>
that's actually interesting. The IRB did not have any problem with that so far. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the idea is really, I think, relevant to what you say, because we see it already right now in some of the wars that are going on, that autonomous weapon systems are being used. And autonomous weapon systems are uh, de defined by selection and engagement. Those are the two steps that these systems can do. Selection meaning they select the target, and engagement means they strike. And if they are fully autonomous, which some of the systems, according to U UN reports, already are, they do both of these steps by themselves. And we want to basically show that, look, this has real danger because people might actually you know, sort of devalue the harm they are doing to other people when they can basically then an algorithm do that. And if you're an economist, maybe we can talk about later how we're doing it because we use willingness to pay for people to not having to do this as a measure. But actually setting up this experiment is very challenging, but nonetheless I think could be very relevant to kind of demonstrate what a lot of people are assuming. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for this interesting talk and uh, um, um, various designs you showed. I have one question. So there was one experiment in which you explained that um, participants know the, that the AI was better in detecting the liar. Mm -hmm. And then um, there was this um, group where the people um, relied on the, uh, on the AI mm -hmm. And you said um, that this shows that they also um, shift their responsibility to the system. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering why you think um, they also shift their responsibility. Um, because they, they could also feel fully responsible and therefore um, rely on the system. That's a very good point. Um, and you are right. So what we don't know is if people feel less responsible for their behavior. So this is more of an interpretation because I think it, to some extent if you assume that people are generally reluctant to do that for two reasons. Well, one is they are aware that if I accuse someone else of lying, this comes with a cost for the other person, but it also comes with a cost to me if I'm wrong. Right? So accusing you of lying already feels bad for you because it's dependent on whether it's true or there's a stigma attached to it. But then if it turns out that actually my accusation was wrong, I might feel responsible. And I, that's what we basically argue that the algorithm could take over. I could say, no, no, it wasn't me. The algorithm said you're lying. So I just followed the order. Right? So that's a bit the interpretation of the results. We don't have data showing that people feel less responsible in this experiment. We do have other studies where we kind of ha have, uh, like basically, we ask people oftentimes, who do you think is responsible in this advice taking task? And we do see that people shift some of the responsibility when they are told by an algorithm to break an ethical rule. They still feel primarily responsible, so we have a scale going from zero to, to 100. They're not going over 50%, so they still feel like they're more in charge. But compared to the treatments where they don't get advice, they blame the algorithm more. Right? So there seems to be some blame shifting or responsibility shifting going on in the advice and the other ex advice experiment that I showed. Here we, we don't have this data. So it's more of an interpretation of the results. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think also from my side for this really uh, cool and interesting talk, um, what I was wondering about is your uh, deception uh, or um, making the AI or the human deceive on your behalf? Mm -hmm. Do you have any data on whether people feel worse when they make another human lie for their profit ah. or make the AI lie? Uh, so this study on the human versus AI, we did a while ago. Let me do a really quick check whether I have it here because I don't remember all the exit questions. Um, I don't think I have it here. No, I don't think I have it here. I don't know anymore, so it was a while ago. <laughs> I will dig it up and let you know. If you, if you let me know your email, and I'll let you know. Because we're writing up the paper right now, and I will put, have to put all of this in the supplementary anyways. In, in short, what we focus on is more the behavioral finding rather than the sort of mechanism behind it. But uh, we did have measures such as guilt, um, responsibility. Uh, we even had in one of the studies like the guilt and shame proneness scale to identify if different individuals would be differently attracted by delegation and we completely did not find anything. So it wasn't like a selection bias effect. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned in your previous answer cost and 
actually in your dice rolling experiment, except from missing out, there was no cost for the participants. Yep. Have you considered having them pay the amount of the odd numbers rolled or yeah. shock them, as you just suggested? Yeah. <laughs> so have nope. them yeah. attach a cost to being honest because sticking up for your principles when it's uncontested is easy. Yeah, yeah. yeah Make it inconvenient to stick to your principles and people may be more inclined to, as you mentioned, try to uh, move around and stick to a middle ground. Yeah, yeah. So two things, I mean, what we did previously, so generally we don't shock people, but we try to, <laughs> uh, in, in other ways, basically to test whether people have certain, or how big the costs have to be for people to change their behavior. One thing that we, for example, sometimes do, and we did that in one of the experiments with the advice, is we told participant, and that was true, that there was a donation that we would be making to a charity organization, which was a thousand euros. Every time they cheated, we would deduct that amount from the donation, right? So in that sense, cheating was more costly, right? And that, by the way, didn't have an influence on people's behavior. They didn't seem to care about it, which is often, we don't, we find that very often in our experiments that they don't, and, and to some extent, I think it has to do with something that we found in another study, which is often observed. People have very pessimistic beliefs about other people's behavior, right? So they basically say, okay, everybody else probably cheats, so, you know, the donation will probably go anyways, so I can also cheat. But if I understood you correctly, so that would be one way to increase the cost of lying. To increase the cost of honesty, we haven't really done that, to be honest. Yeah. Okay, then one last question by Peter. Yeah, just a small question. In the, in the first report on the die rolling data, you just showed the mean value above yeah. three. And then afterwards, you have results on how many people cheated all of the time, how many people cheat a little bit. Yeah. And, and you have to do several trials for yeah. each person to, to, to do. How many trials did you have to do that? Uh, here, we in, the, in this trial, we, in this game, we did 10 rounds. Only 10. Yes, but importantly, that's why also the cheating levels are generally lower. The game is played so that the, the die roll is on the screen. Right? So we know the die roll. We know who cheats. We know per ah. person per round who's cheating. And that right? does not change? It, the... it, it does change in the sense that the overall level of dishonesty sh shifts, right? Like, as I showed you here, uh -huh, okay. the general levels of honesty are relatively high and actually higher than in the advice study, right? So the overall level of honesty shifts. That's what we typically find in this task when you have the die on the screen because anonymity is lower. Um, and therefore, basically, our treatments are moving a little bit more to the left. In the other, we just had one shot, and there we didn't know what they wrote, and that's why we had the mean values across treatments. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So they really cheat in the face of the experiment, huh? Yeah. <laughs> wow, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Promising. Okay, so thank you once again. And I mean, Niels is still around during the reception, so mm -hmm. you can ask many more questions. And then we come to the last part of the like, scientific part. Okay. No, my part is first. Nee, ist okay. Doch. Das ist doch noch kurz. Ach, du noch? Ja. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. We, are, we didn't practice <laughs> this last part. <laughs> um, so I, I hope many of you have seen the posters, um, especially the ones from our uh, Human Agent Network. And, and a question that our race is, of course, now we celebrate this and say, oh, we've done all this nice research, but what happens when this network ends? And I mean, the network ends and the PhDs, one is already had already had her defense, this will end soon. But we have meanwhile additional PhD students or other people working on these topics, like yeah, from individual labs. Um, but we also have several 
projects that um, two of them that started already that also have this naya learning with an AI tutor or writing together with an AI and um, that are already funded and Ulrike has submitted something to Leibniz internal funding which is about this um, yeah, collaborative mind you could say AI and humans working together and one other thing what we did also but this is still submitted to make this more visible and also that we as an institute are working on that, is that we have written an institute-wide paper on generative AI. So members of all labs contributed to that. It's currently under review at Psychologische Rundschau. Now you might say that's not the most high-impact journal, but <laughs> we wanted to make it visible in the German psychology and to raise questions that are from a psychological perspective quite important. And they have this forum, uh, or this format of a discussion forum so hopefully when it gets accepted, then all the divisions could also give their opinions. And I won't go, also because we are a bit above time, uh, I just now mention the three areas that we address. And if you want to know more details, you can ask me during the reception. But one thing, of course, is the psychological diagnostics of generative AI capabilities. I mean, once ChatGPT was out, lots of people gave it all sort of intelligence, university entry, whatever tests. So to some degree, that's is a bit boring because it changes with every new model, but that is of course something that will get more prominent in psychology and which also will get more interesting when you look at longer interactions that, like you ask it something and it says it very self-confident and then you say, but hey, isn't it the other way around? And then it says, oh yeah, that was a mistake. No, it was like that. Um, so these type of things will be very interesting. The other thing is, of course, the impact on humans. I don't think for this audience I have to tell too much, but it also comes a big, uh, bit back to this performance versus acceptance, hopes versus fears discussion. And we also address how it will impact the way that research is conducted, for example, generating stimuli, um, yeah, helping with analysis, writing. But I will shorten this now and will hand on to Ulrike. So it's my job now to welcome you. Detmar, we're very happy that we found you after we researched some time for some very competent colleague. So of course I thought it's too much work for me to do the welcome speech and you can all imagine that I wanted to ask ChatGPT. And of course it knew everything about you, so it was very uh, surprised that it knew your work, it knew your, your expertise. I asked ChatGPT about EVM, and also it knew what we are doing. I asked if it fits what you're doing with us and how it will work, so everything was, was great, and I thought it's too, <laughs> it's too boring to have just, just a speech of ChatGPT. And then I thought, okay, does it know bingo? So bingo is a game that you, and I explained ChatGPT, bingo is a, bay, a game that somebody uh, has to think about terms, about words, and another speak, uh, speaker will have to use these words. Uh, perhaps you know it? Yeah, of course. And so I, I uh, told ChatGPT, tell me some bingo words, three bingo words. And it told me galaxy, harmony, and eclipse. And then I said, that my Morris starts as a new professor at the Leibniz Institute for Wissensmedien. I want to welcome him officially with his short speech. Could you make a suggestion, including the words galaxy, harmony, eclipse? I didn't know eclipse before, so it was the first <laughs> time. It was a learning uh, possibility for me too. And of course, uh, ChatGPT can speak better English than, my, than me, so I thought, it can Ladies and gentlemen, also today as we gather under the vast canopy of our academic galaxy, we are here to welcome a new star among us, Professor Detmar Morris. Just as the stars align in harmony to guide us through the night, <laughs> Professor Morris joins the Leibniz Institute for Wissensmedien to illuminate our journey towards understanding the confluence of language, technology, and education. In the realm of computational linguistics and intelligent language learning, Professor Murs has charted territories that many have yet to explore. His work, much like an eclipse, has the power to transform our perspective, revealing the hidden potentials in the interaction between human cognition and digital innovation. Let us embrace this new era of collaboration and discovery, confident that our collective endeavors will reach new heights. 
Together, we will unlock mysteries of digital learning and communication, propelled by the insights and leadership of Professor Murs. Welcome, Professor Murs, to our academic family. May our journey together be as expansive as the galaxy, as harmonious as the spheres, and as transformative as an eclipse. Great, isn't it? <laughs> so, a warm welcome. A warm welcome to you. And we have these artificial flowers with some arrows here. <laughs> And we have real flowers. Welcome to the event. Thank you very much. A good starting stuff. <laughs> Yours, so yours. Yeah, yeah. I take it here. I hope that the eclipse now will get dark. I <laughs> will hope it will stay bright and um, won't last until it's dark outside. <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot for, I'm uh, really excited. We've, in a sense, since coming to Tübingen 2008, we then met in a context in particular in LEED. And I always um, uh, had, um, it was great to see the people who could work on the topic that I found interesting already during the daytime, whereas I, working at the university, <laughs> had to work uh, on these uh, at night and um, over the weekend. And now I will have the opportunity of also being a professional in this domain that we've so far tried to work on uh, for some years now on language, and um, we saw language come up in a number of contexts already today in these exciting talks. It was really mind-opening again today to see these broad, I'm really looking forward to being at the um, EVM to see such a spectrum of exciting research as we saw already today at the posters and the talks we all saw. Um, I will talk a bit about uh, language and AI and learning, which connects to the context, but really focus more on the language. And I downplayed a bit the side there are more research-focused things in the SLA domain, second language acquisition domain, and I thought I'd give you more of an overview that it's much more than just, just tutoring systems or just chat GPT or just so that you see a bit of the spectrum that we can deal with, and I would encourage everyone to then join. We have some years, I think about 15 years or so I have ahead of me, hopefully, um, <laughs> and uh, then we can see what kind of topics we can jointly work on. First, um, very often nowadays with chat GPT, it's uh, basically... It, it seems to be everything. People call you on the phone and, oh, you do chat GPT? And I say, no, I, I'm a computational linguist. But, but everything, like, people forget that digital learning and supporting digital um, learning through digital tools is actually, a, has long been a topic um, in public discourse. So think about this, this originally is in German. Computers in all schools, all students at the computers, this is a program the ministers of education want to realize quickly. So when was this actually written? What do you think? Quite good. This is 84. <laughs> and you can see that this is a bit outdated by the... Uh, this, the sweater would be very popular again because it's, it's 80s, right? <laughs> but uh, the computer, you can see that's no longer quite uh, what we would have on our desk today. So let's keep that in mind. And let's also keep in mind that computers are already being used in education. And what we really need to argue now is what are we doing? So my talk will be, will, um, before we, we talked about language in some aspects, but now I'll move this into learning and education, particularly second language education, but it applies uh, throughout uh, um, education because language also is, of course, needed to communicate other subject matters as well. But in many, many contexts, it's used, computers are used to motivate. You give people authentic materials, multimedia materials, and that indeed my son, who's now uh, finishing his university degree was in the first um, tablet class that was actually St Stefan Schwan of the IVM was doing the uh, Wissenschaftliche Begleitung, scientific um, accompanying this. And what, what came out of the first tablet class in Tübingen um, was um, it's great because schools can't afford color copies, but the tablets have color displays. <laughs> Right? So we should not, it's, it's a real benefit and it's lighter to carry for the poor children who don't have, and the other thing was, teachers can give kids homework after they've forgotten it when they're still already at home through the <laughs> tablets. So that is kind of, computers do serve a purpose and they are being used. Um, 
And uh, so also communication, um, you know, giving people homework um, is a communication means. And that for language learning is amazing because did you see that in PISA, one score really increased English language education really had a better effect. No, it's not English language education, it's access to English language materials. And so um, if you then com communicate with native speakers or listen to materials on YouTube, listen to the gamers, and um, a lot of young children watch the cool YouTubers who happen to speak English. And uh, so then there's also mechanical practice, which is existing, but it's mechanical. And that's a problem because it doesn't actually know what it's teaching, why it's teaching, and to whom it's teaching. And uh, we'll see later on that the most advanced tools like ChatGPT also share some of these problems of not knowing who we're teaching and how, what we want to teach them. But let's come to that later. The key thing is, let's not forget, education has been, um, people have attempted to uh, promise revolutions for a long time <laughs> and it hasn't happened. Um, school right now um, is pretty much as it was when I went to school until the mid 80s. And uh, so um, what, what's changing now? And there you could say, well, AI. AI is changing things, but let's see how. And is it in the way that you see on the right-hand side? Because what people then talk about is, again, the buzzwords, um, ChatGPT, and then robots. And the interesting thing is, so does anything improve by a robot, who's, by the way, white, um, using chalk in white to... <laughs> do something that uh, the public perceives as science. Lots of formulas, no, no matter what on earth it's showing up there. So let's now think about then what is AI actually and kind of how can it potentially provide um, an advance um, at, for language in particular education. So, and that's where um, in particular when you talk to people from newspapers, journalists, um, they always equate AI with ChatGPT right now. And so the first thing is very important to really bring them down and say it's not machine learning. No, it's just imitating abilities with the computers that a human needs intelligence for. All the other definitions, you know, are highly problematic. Um, I think AI has a long tradition and we need to acknowledge that because also the future, I think the success in the future will be based on our ability to integrate what has worked in the past with what the methods allow right now. So let's not forget that traditional approach since the 50s, so basically before any of the people here in the room, including me, were born, um, was so successful that in 1997, if you go back um, and Google Garry Kasparov and uh, Big Blue, Deep Blue, then you find lots of articles that sound like they were written right now. It says, finally, the computers now will take over. And um, Minsky said, um, you know, we, if we're lucky, they will keep us as pets. And um, right, so all of this hype that comes up and then it goes down again. But let's not forget that indeed, Deep Blue in 1997 was better in chess than any human alive, right? So, and that is a success. It comes at a cost. Somebody put a lot of money into building Deep Blue and lots of knowledge went in there. But um, the key thing for us to remember is, the problem is um, the knowledge and the rules that need to be explicitly encoded is very costly and there's a lack of robustness. It can do this one task very well, but if you let it play Go, which later on another team did, you had to start from scratch, basically. Then machine learning also has been around for a long time. It's not new. Since the 80s, people have had systems learning from data, which is not putting your knowledge in, but putting data in. And there was another tradition which at first was fighting the theorists, you know, corpus-based linguistics in a sense was collecting lots of data and these people were doing lots of theories and they didn't talk to one another for a long time. Um, and the problem there was it's successful only when there's a lot of data available and if you know what you want, you must have the labels and labels are costly. Either you need the expertise or you do crowdsourcing and then crowdsourcing came up and so on. So that's basically the setup in the 80s and then what um, happened for me when I was preparing for this I looked at when did it change when it actually hit the real world because until for a long time I was giving talks as a computational linguist and people had no idea what on earth a computational linguist is. And then suddenly Siri appeared and cars started to talk and that was in 2011. That was the first time in a sense where uh, systems successfully in real life did tasks that people just wanted to get done and not uh, because they liked you, they typed in the right example sentence so that your parser would run properly. Um, and so these systems were all hybrid. So that's something to keep in mind here. Rules, knowledge, data, and in a sense, these systems from 2011 on were working in reality. Why? Because they combined it. Don't guess if you know. If you know the regularity, put it in. 
but also make it robust so that the actual data that you evaluate and you can successfully deal with actual data. And these things abound now, digital systems, dialogue systems and cars, machine translation, recommender systems, all of these basically use these kind of hybrid architectures. And now comes the big turning point why, in, in a sense, computational linguistics from um, you're having to explain half, half a party what you do, um, and then um, now everyone knows apparently what computational linguistics is, namely um, large language models um, is the only thing you need. And the big turning point is something that's often forgotten. Um, the key issue, the reason computational linguistics became popular is because language data abounds. There's a lot of language data, and then the idea that people had is if we've got these cool deep neural networks, these systems that need lots of training data, where can we get training data? Well, we've got data, but how can we make it labels? Where can we do labels? Oh, you know what? We take all that data, and we always hide some of it, and then we let the system predict it. You know, you basically mask some words, and there's different ways to do it, but that's a brilliant idea because it turns data into supervised learning task, right? So the idea is that you use the data not just as what you want to classify, but also as what you want to predict. And that's the key insight. And suddenly now you've got trillions of words out there because the internet has grown, the web has grown, lots of data is available, and even not just on the web, but also companies have amazing repositories of language data. And that was the turning point. Um, and so um, the key thing then to why it's important is language, um, large language models know about the world only through the language that they learn to predict, because that's what we do, right? We hide some of it and then we predict it. You know, hide the next word, predict it, hide the next word, predict it. And the more context you can use, then the better these systems got. And in a sense, I would call that radical Wittgenstein because it means that the boundaries of my language are the boundaries of my world in a very radical sense, right? So the only way, and now that's of course what a lot of researchers um, are working on, how can you have multimodal training data, how can you have um, other sources of grounding uh, something in, um, in the world, but right now, what you get out of li as likely language is just as much written by Adolf Hitler as it is by Perry Roden and so on, right? So, and it's clear all of this language data is in there and we don't know exactly what it is in there. It's just um, whatever they happen, they happen to have gotten their hands on. And um, just to illustrate one point where you can immediately see in statistical machine translation, I used to translate uh, the sentence mag ich. In German, you can drop the topic, mag ich. In English, you can't say that. Normally, you can't say, I like. So therefore, the machine translation system, based on statistical likelihood, exactly, you know, training there, had to give what is the most likely thing you like. And now ask yourself, if I ask you, what do you like most? What's the most prominent thing you would like? You would say, my partner, chocolate, red wine, sunshine, but you would not, <laughs> my work, yeah, sorry, I mean, at the IBM, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so... Guess what? The system, uh, Google Translate, spit out for a long time for a markig. They changed it now, but for a long time it did that. I like this web page. <laughs> <laughs> right? So what does that mean? It means, yes, of course, in that training data, what you like often is web pages. Does that re correspond to your world? No, not at all. Lots of data doesn't mean it fits your world very well. It's just lots of data. Okay. So um, what can we already do? We can do lots of things. And uh, so a broad range of op opportunities also for education. And here I just show one thing because then I can show you also the limits and then we can see where we can then contribute and overcome these limits. Um, you can generate text, everyone knows that, in dialogues. And the reason it's interesting for learning is because of variability. So I think it will be an excellent tool for teachers to say, give me a couple of texts that have these properties, and then it can generate them. And learning is about the ability to transfer to outside of what you've learned, transfer appropriate processing. So you don't want to train you know, circus ponies, but you actually want to basically train people who can deal with all the things out there in the world that they have to face. So you need to have enough variability in the training so that it generalizes to something outside. All right, so imagine you're now a teacher, um, and uh, you, this is now uh, putting it into an English tutor, pretend to be an English tutor and teach me the difference between past perfect and simple past. So a typical seventh grade English teacher who has about five minutes to prepare for class. Um, okay, great, hello, I'd be happy to help you. It gives you an explanation. Great, it generates this. Then you can ask yourself, what is the limit of that? Well, it will basically, why can it generate it? It has seen a lot of explanation, a lot of didactic materials about English and so on. So now what can you rely on, what can't you rely on? 
you can rely on this being well-formed language, which is not a little thing to say. Here, this, the, you can't read it very well, um, but it is strikingly, you wouldn't know how many years we've spent in computational linguistics trying to do generation so that these sentences actually read like proper English sentences. It does that extremely well. But it doesn't provide reliable knowledge. Why? Well, chat GPT and GPT, langu large language models, always produce fictional text. It always generates new text. and keep, um, You don't have to worry about plagiarism in this case because plagiarism means you're taking somebody else's, a natural person's properties, and making them your own. Chat GPT doesn't, is not a, um, a natural person. It doesn't have any intellectual property rights. It, of course, violates, likely, when they built it, the rights of the people. But every time it produces text, it produces new text. It's always fictional. It's wrong to say it hallucinates. It always produces fictional text. It just sometimes happens to connect to the contents that we know of the world, but it doesn't have to. It just always optimizes the likelihood of the language sequence whether it connects to the world or not. You know, it's not, it's proper. Um, it doesn't know about the world. It only knows about likely sequences. Therefore, also, it has problems with abstractions because it doesn't analyze. It just basically, um, pr yeah, it just knows about surface forms. It doesn't know, know about underlying properties. And very importantly, it cannot detach itself from the social and cultural context of the language that it's trained on, what we call bias, a good example for that was when people did math on these representations, on these embeddings, and they took queen, subtracted um, uh, the vector for uh, female, and added male, you got out king. Oh, great, fantastic. But if you took programmer and subtracted male and added female, you got housewife. <laughs> and there you can see that um, likely, not just likely, that's the way the world is in the text that they trained it on, but it may not be what you would like in the way that you produce text that correspond to the way you see the world. Okay, we get to what that means for learning in a second. And then modeling learners also, who knows what and how do I get them to um, further towards their curric curricular goals? If you don't know where the learners are, which you need diagnostics for, psychologists, and you don't know what you're taking them to, then how can it be a tutor? A tutor needs to know who am I taking, where, in order to be able to support the learning. Okay, that'll become important. Now, about the abstraction. Here's an example. Sorry, it's so small print, but I wanted to give you the full context. I said, can you give me an exercise? Actually, I didn't say that. In full disclosure, this is Florian who typed this in for me, because he, uh, when I was at the university, I didn't have a license, but he's a teacher and he had a license. <laughs> okay, so he typed this and then said, give me an exercise, and now it's a fill in the blank. Yesterday, Jane, her friend, and so on, and you're supposed to fill in tenses, blah, 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 where the fill in the blank was the correct um, verb forms. All right, and then even gives me the verbs, you know, read, have, discuss, tell, finish, and there's one over here, meet. And then he says, up here for the sentence, yesterday, Jane, her friend. Okay, then he says, meet. What does the system say? Great, you've got the first one correct. The simple past uh, tense is used and so on. So it doesn't know that simple past because that's an abstraction. It's a categorization, and it's not a one-off. Uh, so we went on corrected it, and then just like you said, it says, apologies for the confusion. And then it goes on, second one here, before they, each other, and then have met, he puts in, and then they says, good job, you've used the past perfect. But have met is not the past perfect, but the present perfect, right? And you see, poor system, we're yelling at it for, well, let's not get into the emotion part, <laughs> but we are, we are complaining about a property that in terms of sequences, it's done such beautiful language sequences. It's just not very good at matching scientific categorizations of what language is with these certain forms that are put in. So be very careful what you ask it. If you ask ChatGPT to produce language, great. But if you ask ChatGPT to perform an, an, perform an analysis task, ask yourself whether that can be a derivative of having seen lots of language or not. Okay, so much for that. Bias, one example from the education sector that's less uh, dramatic than the housewife example, um, which is published, by the way, if you look for programmer, housewife, and distribution semantics, you find the paper where they actually do that. Um, and uh, is here, um, create, create a class test about social media. Now, what kind of class test is it generating? Multiple choice, true, false things, and then... Um, short answer questions, exactly the way you would pose it in an American college context, right? So 
Is it an accident? No, that's what it has seen. Most of its training data are from this context. Therefore, if we just take products trained on lots of language, we will get the educational norms of a context like the US. And that's something we should think about, whether that is the idea of basically bringing with the software, bringing in the um, social, set, the cultural setting and the educational setting that comes, that this data comes from. All right, so now, onto what we then can, um, we use large language models, but I want to show you a bit more systematic now that um, tools are great, but ultimately we need to ask you ourselves, what are we trying to do? And there I would propose and to not take digitalization and AI as values in, the, in of themselves, but to ask, what do we want to facilitate? So not just play and see what happens. A lot of research in ChatGPT now is, look what happens to have happened when I happen to have done something. And the answer is, and next week? Well, next week will be different. And so um, we need to go beyond that and ask, what do we want to facilitate? Is it something we really need in education? If it's not needed in education, you won't get subjects who are happy to help you in field studies, and then you can't get data. And most importantly, do you actually know something about the mechanisms that you're trying to foster? A tool doesn't solve anything. It solves something if it helps you implement a mechanism from psychology, from pedagogy, from second language acquisition research. Okay, and what do we then do with these tools? Well, we want tools to be interactive. Keep in mind now, it's no longer just digital media from the beginning, communication, multimedia, but what's the next step? I said AI. Well, but then I trashed AI a bit, but on the other hand, I think AI has something to, to offer. Interactivity. Interactive tools are much better than passive consumption of TV. They try to put kids in front of a TV, make it learn Chinese by, and also listen to Mozart, play lots of Mozart around the kid, it'll become a musician. You know, implicit incidental learning. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, why not? Well, because there's no meaning, there's no interactivity. Okay, we need that. And we need adaptivity, because not one size fits all but we need to basically pull people along in their zone of proximal development. We need to provide material at the learner's level in terms of language, in terms of content, in terms of the subject matter that they're interested in. How? So is there a way to do it with AI? Yes. But you need to analyze and generate language. You need to model the learners. You need to model the learning goals. What am I trying to teach them? It doesn't just happen to emerge automatically by using ChatGPT. And you need to actually analyze and generate adaptive learning activities. You need to know which materials are appropriate to teach what to whom. And there are a lot of variables there, to whom, individual differences all there. And the truth is when now um, talking to, uh, you can tell I've been talking to a lot to, with journalists lately, and trying to uh, communicate that adaptivity is really matching and not just if you already know, you don't need to learn it anymore, <laughs> right? And matching, this is very hard and we, the truth is, in our science, we do not have answers to all these questions of what's the right thing to do, but we now can test it, and I'll show you how. So, but why do we want to do it? We want to support learners and teachers, and it is, must be grounded in mechanisms that exist. So I'll show you now mechanism, um, way to implement it, what you could study. Okay, mechanisms in education psychology, uh, cognitive psychology are around, you know them. Uh, I briefly tell you about SLA because you probably few people in the room are doing second language acquisition research. Um, they've done that since the 60s. Uh, more research was on first language acquisition uh, separate, but then it basically by 2000, there was so much work that Darian Larson Freeman said, you know what, we are a separate field. We shouldn't just be summed under, well, it's some form of pedagogy or psychology or language learning. First language learning is different from second language learning. Let's still look at foundations, let's look at instruction, and look, let's look at the practice and let's distinguish them. A lot of people only do the foundational stuff. Instructed SLA has only become popular now where you can actually gather data in reality much more efficiently than before. Before, Instructed SLA research was kind of this ugly sister that's not proper science, but now we're getting there to actually do science in reality, in, outside the lab. The lab is real, but in a different way. Um, okay, so... Um, Oh, and if I can say one thing uh, on that, because uh, it's real, and there's a lot of people here younger than me, and so it's interesting to now mention one thing that um, one tends to think the, as time goes on, there's more accumulation of knowledge. But when I started studying at the University of Tübingen in 1988, there was actually Kaminsky, an ecological psychologist, 
who did say exactly what I just said now, that you need to study things outside in the world in an ecologically valid environments. This was in 1988, and he retired, I don't know, in 94 or something like this. Yeah, and, and he still advises Sonderforschungsbereich and so on. So it's very interesting to keep in mind. It's worth sometimes also going to the library and reading things that are from, you know, even, you know, 1880 or whatever. And a lot of things that we think we're very smart now <laughs> have actually been thought of by people before. We just didn't pay much attention to them. When I got there, he had his lecture at 8 a.m. on Friday mornings. And I was my first semester, so I must admit I probably missed most of the things I could have known in my life when I didn't go to these lectures but slept. Okay. But um, now, so the, the goal um, is to understand the factors and mechanisms involved in SLA. And the key factors identified include input, you know, what comes in as reading and listening material, noticing and focus on form, I need to explain that in a minute, practice and feedback, you kind of know where that's going. And the important part in particular is we can finally study, uh, there used to be this field called aptitude treatment interaction. And the big problem was they stopped studying it in the 90s or so because all these interactions of um, aptitude and which treatment for whom, basically you couldn't study it because you didn't have enough subjects. And interactions are terrible to study because you need a lot of data. And now I think we can do it. So individual differences, in the meantime, people have pointed out lots of individual differences, cognitive, motivational, social, subject, and all of these differences matter, in particular also for foreign language learning. So now we can try to start taking them into account. Okay. Now, what's input? At first, people actually thought input is everything. If you think about what a kid does, the idea was, you know, the so-called poverty of the stimulus uh, argument, Chomsky said there's input can't be everything, but still, the idea is what they hear and the environment they're in allows them to, to produce, to name things, and so on. So input is essential, language input for language learning, and it has to step-by-step step get more and more complex. I plus one, your level, in individual plus one. And then the input should be stepwise increased, and the idea is that in pedagogy we make use of that and we stepwise feed them more, um, more complex material. Um, the AI tools can help us in that because they also tried with humans. Um, there has been in Baden-Württemberg a study where they actually did that. They trained um, educators, in particular kindergartnerinnen, um, child caregivers, and young teachers, elementary school teachers, in you, uh, changing the way they speak to the children so that they can adapt to the level of the children and they failed. <laughs> Why? Well, have you ever tried doing that? Have you tried to speak differently at the right level of the language to children where you didn't do any diagnostics? That's impossible. You cannot individualize and uh, adapt your language to the individuals you talk to, um, at least uh, not to the extent that they hoped. So what you can do is you can, and this is a, a picture you can tell, you know, advertising, Xiaobin Xian um, uh, has very... Um, um, innovative um, slogans, a simple and intelligent way to promote language proficiency. You get coffee, you get a, um, um, a tablet, and the rest follows easily. You just type in your text, and that's actually a brilliant idea that Xiaobin had. How do you know where people are? Well, just observe them. Give them language, analyze it, then you can put it on scale here, basically. You can also, you'll see in a second that I criticize this as too academic because very few children are interested in the mean length of a clause <laughs> of their production, right? But at least the system visualizes it for you. And now comes the cool part, challenge me. You can say, give me text. And then the plus one, we leave it up to the kid or the, the reader. You can go to the challenge level, one up, and then it changes the text so that the property in the language plus the challenge level characterizes that property in, in the text. So this is now material that's good for you to read. The problem is, am I now interested in UN working groups suggesting work on racial reconciliation, right? I'm not just reading because I want the right language for me, <laughs> right? I want to read something because of the contents. So we realized it's too... Um, too academic. Um, it's, it's nice, you know, you match adaptively, but um, we should also, we should give the teachers the right to change, you know, general proficiency level. I'm looking for a B2 text, but it should also have, you know, phrasal verbs and this and this rich, and then the student doesn't care about that. They just care about what they like in terms of content. I like skiing. Oh, you like skiing? Right now the racing season is on. And if you heard all the bike crashes and these races, it's just terrible. And there the bus race was on and then, right. So you may be interested in that or you may hate that and say, oh no, they shouldn't be, uh, there's still skiing going on at the same time or uh, music. So give learners the right to search what they're interested in, 
but give teachers the right to massage it in such a way that the results also contain what they want to teach the kids. So it's a bit like in the US, you get milk with um, vitamin A and D enriched because you're not spending enough time outside, right? So that's the idea, you en en enrich the material. So that's um, Maria Cinkina's work um, in the lead context. It's a search engine, you type stuff down there. For example, if you're a young kid and actually also an old geezer, you may be interested in climate change. Um, and then you can say, for example, BBC, you don't have to give a site. And then you get results. That's like a normal search engine, not, no rocket science here. But then you can also um, go to the left-hand side. The teacher could have in the background said, I want lots of phrasal verbs. And then what it does, it re-ranks it so that the top results are not just about your topic, but also contain are at the language level. And here I was at, um, you can see these are language levels. Whoop. Over here, A1, A2, B1, B2, these are language levels. And you can see no text at the most simple level. Um, but at B1, B2, you can find some text. You could now remove the C1, C2, and say phrasal verbs. And then you get phrasal verbs in here. And you can see them on the right. So here, end up lay down, and now the teacher or the student could either take it, and in school you would now print it on a black and white printer and uh, hand it to the students, um, but you could also, we now also generate automatically for the individuals with ChatGPT, not actually, not ChatGPT, with using large language model, we generate um, questions with um, multiple choice answers, and then the student can do this with their text, and then the teacher only needs to see who did the reading, who didn't, even though they read all their read different texts. That's the idea. Okay, then is that everything? And the answer is if you've, if you've ever, for example, in England, exited the airport, you were kind of tired, you were walking down, you look down and said, look right, and you said, oh, that's noticing. It tells you where to look, where your organs should go so that you don't get killed. Right? <laughs> and here, the idea is also, it's not an input, it's not enough. What happens if you just have input is you develop what's called a basic variety or a pigeon, like, um, kommen morgen, schauen Fußball, du ich, bier ich, du Würstchen. Um, right? And by that, you have communicated that you do a joint barbecue and uh, you're coming over. That's basic variety. No morphology, fixed word order, and it works. A lot of people in Germany speak this way successfully <laughs> after many years, but the problem is you don't acquire the more subtle characteristics of German. And there are certain things you can't express. Your Bildungssprache, your academic language, you will be cut off from a lot of information that's conveyed in different ways. So you need to notice, and that's what's also called a focus on form, incidental focus on form. So what can you do with um, AI tools? You can visually enhance the web, uh, or also what we now do, I won't show that to you, but we can generate questions on those passages of the text that we want the learner to pay more attention to, um, and thereby they increase the cognitive activation of their processing. But let me show you just visually. Um, this is, for example, a text that, the, um, that I thought was kind of cute for language teaching, namely cows also have regional accents. In particular, note the multimedia. You can click on cow moo recordings, and then, <laughs> and then you can get the Somerset drawl <laughs> of these cows. It, well, that's pretty cool, right? But, Right now, it's not what are you learning in terms of language. Well, well, yeah, perhaps something you may pick up uh, Somerset um, because you didn't have that vocabulary before. But if I now sh ask you, for example, things like that are hard for us, it's always prepositions and, and particles and things like that. How many are in there? Um, let me see. If I show this to you, they're immediately apparent, right? So do you see the d that here? Now you see these prepositions, they're short, um, they're, they're purple. <laughs> And um, they are, um, you can see which ones there are, where they are. So it's clear that visually input enhancement is effective, is possible, and it allows you to perceive things just like look right. Um, I know where right is, I just wouldn't have looked there without um, that kind of additional salience of that property. This is something that also, to bring it to um, a different context, syllables are important um, when children learn how to read. But who wants to read a book that, like, um, in particular, which parents want to sit down with their kids and looking for the 50th time uh, the book where George plays soccer with so-and-so, the one book that you have with these colors um, uh, on the syllables so that the kid can also practice reading. How about doing that with any text? So this is something with Heiko Holz, um, who also worked with us in, in LEAD, did his PhD with us. Any text can be put in and you can highlight visually um, as the syllables, you can do stress syllables, unstressed syllables, all kind of things in different ways. There's different um, teachers now and students and p 
um, caregivers can take any text and visually enhance it in such a way that it um, facilitates reading for early readers. So a very simple example, but a very practical case. All right, now the last type of thing, practicing. Um, so first important thing is why practice? And the answer is, so in particular, I went to my parents, uh, who are, my father's 88, they had a big newspaper and says, school gets rid of practice. <laughs> you know, no more homework. Um, school has decided not was fine, uh, that, that just, you know, we no longer have slaves that, who we drill to kind of uh, take their hammers and uh, beat these, these verbs until they have the right forms, you know, kind of, let's get rid of practice. For some reason, they didn't get rid of the driving schools, um, even though there you could also just give them the pamphlet, put them in a car, and hey, let's do it, right? They know the rules, um, but there they um, haven't done that yet, perhaps. Yeah, let's see. Um, <laughs> but so the idea is practice is needed for one very important thing, automated proceduralized behavior. If I now had to think of the rules for expressing things in English, I would not be able to communicate at all, right? It wouldn't be fluent, it wouldn't be well-formed, and I couldn't pay attention to what I want to say because I have to pay attention to how I say it. And therefore, practice is crucial. In this audience, that's probably less um, criticized, but you'd be surprised how teachers say, why should I do this? You know, just uh, I tell them, and why do they still do it? I, I told them last week what the rule is, and they still write this. How is that possible, right? And then they forget it during the summer break again, you know. Well, guess why? Um, okay, so, but how can students be effectively practicing given the huge individual differences? And uh, there's no, I mean, if parents are at home, sure, then you're worried about uh, equity. Why are t parents who speak English um, doing a better job at helping their kids with their homework? Well, because they know what they're learning, and that's not fair. So we need to facilitate adaptive practice uh, for everyone. And uh, that will then um, allow teachers who have limited time with the students to do other things in class. So let's think about that. And that's where we came up with the, the tutoring system feedback uh, that many of you will know. So I will only briefly show you. This is the way I started. we started out. And actually, I know um, since my son wrote this, um, I asked him, why did you end here? And not just so I cut it off down there, but this is not a full sentence. And he said, well, you know, the line was full. <laughs> Right? So kids do not know the goal of an activity. They do not have the kind of meta-linguistic knowledge of, oh, I still need some more practice on this. I guess I'm not yet mastering that. So they just fill this thing out, and therefore homework is known to be ineffective as a practice um, context. If you do it electronically, you can directly provide them with feedback. Let me walk you through two examples. Off to Greece again. Today it's now nice sunny, but you, you can increase motivation by lowering the blinds when the kids do this. Off to Greece again, um, you can fly to sunny Greece with Mr. Lambraki, and then you can check mid-air versus air con, and um, which one would you take, and then you're asked to write quest uh, sentences down there to compare when, why um, you book which. So it is a language focus, but it is meaning-based, and then the kid down there writes, um, the tickets at Aircon are expensive than at midair, you know, express themselves, fine, well done. But uh, the system now says when an adjective has three or more syllables, we form a comparative with more and superlative with most. So this is for the gymnasium, and uh, this is written by teachers who, are, um, who, are, who told us that's the way they would explain it to the kids. You can, Gemeinschaftsschule, we found that doesn't work as well, and that's, of course, research which feedback for which students to achieve which goals. But it's not just form, it's also meaning. Gillian's diary, you read some text, and uh, this kid learned, I took the screenshot when Trump was still president, um, or let's, well, I guess it may be current again in, some, uh, in a year, um, so you just always say, it is great, right? It's, it's well formed, um, the system's not going to yell at you, you know, adjectives, superlatives, whatever, it's great, always fits, just repeat it. Um, but the system now, what is it doing? It could say, well done, uh, well formed English sentence, no, it says, there seems to be important information missing in your answer. So another kind of scaffolding, you highlight where is it that the information is, which is very different from providing um, them with scaffolding on the way to express themselves in the language. Both exist, and that's called, um, well, feedback on meaning. Please look where it is, and then you can see up there, drive to the coast, his sister goes to Wildings, okay. So then you say his sister goes there, and then comes 
we are talking about something that happened in the past, please use the simple past, and that's called incidental focus on form. So it is when it is appropriate in a meaning-based functional task, you also highlight, oh, by the way, that's not quite the way you would say it. Here's uh, how to improve also the language. So it's a mixture, form, meaning in a functional context. That's the idea. All right. So what does this bring us? Uh, what does it yield us? Well, it's immediately supporting students in their understanding of what they're supposed to learn. Um, it's automatic. You do not have to encode this in, that's why it's AI, because it's not encoded in the activity, but it's encoded in what you put the activity into, and then it knows about English, it knows about the curriculum, and it knows about the, um, um, the potential pedagogical interventions, so the types of feedback. Feedback is not generated automatically. Well, it's generated automatically, but the 187 different types of misconceptions kids may have come from teachers. So the pedagogy comes from teachers, the curriculum comes from um, the government, you know, the English curriculum, and the, uh, the activities somebody wrote. And what we, we basically do is we put the AI in to connect different types of feedback to uh, the different things uh, students may write in different contexts. So that's automatic. Now, does it work? And the short answer is yes. <laughs> so, but what doesn't, you can't just say, what I don't want to say is, use a tool. The tool does this. We didn't test how good is the feedbook. What we tested is, how good is it to provide specific feedback on language means in the curriculum to students? So that's a very different thing. Do you see that? Like just how good is the system? You know, well, it has nice colors. I like the buttons, but not the interface on the Mac. The Windows interface is better. That's not what we're researching. We're researching, does feedback work? And we're using the system as a platform to try this out. How did we do it? Randomization within the class. In a year, if you do a full year study, there are dozens of things they need to learn in that year, right? So now take the class, split it in half, each class, and then give different uh, learning targets for the different people within the same class. Uh, everyone uses the system. Everyone gets feedback on meaning, on orthography, on ma many other constructions, but not on the ones that we're targeting, where we always flip. One group gets feedback on this, the other group gets feedback on that, and then we can compare pre-test, post-test, did it work or not. And there you get 63% higher learning gains on what's on the curriculum, um, so also what was tested in the exams. So we were lucky that we did it in such a way that every kid benefited, otherwise the parents would, I guess, kill us, kill us by now. Um, so, but uh, Cohen's D, for those who are in this business, uh, 0.56, for a fully embedded year study, that's a pretty good uh, effect size. Um, because you have to imagine that these, you, we didn't tell the teachers anything. We just gave them the system, use this for the, the kids' homework. All right, so should be slowly five minutes or should be? Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So um, for kids like it because they learn more without more effort. Teachers like it because they have to, they're relieved of some work. Um, therefore, they allow you to go into class. And this does not make every kid equal, but it, allows every kid to participate. So that's a very big difference. Indeed, at this point, when talking to journalists, they always say, but it, it, inequality is not eradicated. No, people just are different. That's the way life is. But it makes a big difference whether, if you open the gap, whether it goes this way or whether it goes this way, <laughs> right? So if this is the level, because we want to allow everyone to participate in democracy, in their job, and so on. So the idea is to bring everyone above a threshold that they can reach. It's not to make everyone equal because everyone should have opportunities not um, kind of to participate. Not, you need to be able to rise to your own level of ability. That's the key idea. And we facilitate that with such a system. Um, and the researchers benefit because they can research the mechanisms in the real life. And the textbook authors and the curricular designers benefit because they can actually find out, or we told them, passive in seventh grade English, get rid of it. It doesn't belong there. Kids don't learn it. Don't waste their time. It just frustrates teachers. It's empirical, you can try it out. All right, problem is, if you think about this now for your own work, as soon as you put things in real life, you lose control. And that's a big problem. So how do we deal with it? And there's one term for it, learning analytics. So let me show you that term before I wrap up. Um, since we don't tell the teacher what to do, we run into what Michael Long already in 1980 pointed out as kind of the black box phenomenon. You control this in the beginning. You know, you tell the teachers, do this, uh, and so on. How do they implement it? You have two different classrooms. You don't know what they actually did, in particular in a full year study. Who knows what happened, right? I mean, 
there's all kinds of things that are, you know, the guinea pig of the teacher died, or actually in one case it was our kid, um, uh, the dog of the teacher died, and that had a major impact on what the teacher was tell telling them in class for the next three weeks. Um, so uh, in principle, what is happening in the classroom you can only deduce, and that's a problem because we want to test the impact of what is happening in the classroom. So we need to know what we control, is it actually in the class? So what do we do with this loss of control? Well, we do learning analytics. We look at what did they actually do. How can we do it? Because it's digital. It's digital, so we have rec traces of all the clicks, of all the um, responses, and so on. So, for example, who saw which type of feedback? We can show that here for phase two, intervention control group, grammar topics one and two, you can see these two groups get different. This is the number of feedback messages they saw in, um, by group, blue and red. Here, these other ones, you can see that both groups got it. That's, you know, true, fault, true feedback and orthography feedback. And then this is the amount of feedback we hid. So the system internally saw it, but didn't tell the kids. You know, keep in mind for each group that the, the blue one has the red hidden, the red one has the blue hidden, right? That's the idea. So you can see exactly, yes, they used it. Yes, they got feedback. Yes, they typed something that they would have gotten feedback on had it been provided, and then you thereby can interpret the numbers that result. For whom is it effective? You can also study that. Let me just show you this, this group here. We clustered the learners. These are the ones who submit late and try to strive for accuracy in their submissions. There, the difference between control group and intervention group is biggest. For the other groups, not. So, to, for a system to be effective, you also need to encourage kids to really engage with it, to not say, done my homework, press the button, done. Early submitters didn't do well. They didn't benefit from the feedback. Late submitters who don't care about the accuracy also didn't benefit. Well, they did benefit, that's this group. They also benefited, but barely. And so you really also need um, the kids. Um, using a system requires particular kind of yeah, cognitive activation and so on, um, all the other properties, motivation. All right, so let's wrap it up. Yeah, task context, I think, let's jump over. It's another study with 800 kids, which shows that it helps to tell the kids why they're practicing. You know, if you tell them, if you practice this, then you can participate next week in our discussion of who gets to use a mobile phone. When am I allowed to use mobile phones in class? And then they will practice conditional clauses and so on, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because then they get here, there's a little thing that's a trophy that's called the ready to go -ness. I want to be ready to go for this discussion to be able to participate. And sure enough, it shows up. You, we found that a task-based dashboard helps. Okay, but um, yeah, and this is um, Xiaobin Xian's work on spoken language. We can also do this with spoken language. But let's wrap it up. So digital tools can support a range of aspects, yes, but only where the mechanisms exist. So GPT is not a deus ex machina that suddenly comes down and then a bright light appeared and everyone spoke in languages, right? That happens in one book, uh, but there the evidence is slim that it actually happened this way. And so the idea is that we need mechanisms that are actually established and people know about, and then we can facilitate these mechanisms in reality. That's the idea. Input adapted to the learner level, adaptive practice, input connected to output. Um, so dialogue systems, for example, are, uh, are great. And you need AI tools for that, otherwise you can't analyze and generate. You don't know where the learners are, you don't know where the activities uh, fit, and you don't know what you are guiding them to. And therefore, um, integrating these AI tools with the practice that has information about the curricular goals and the learners' diagnostics and so on is important. And then you actually have the best of all. In a sense, you can do research in reality. Uh, the learners and teachers benefit. And you can uh, then understand, our understanding develops, and then we can improve the tools further. So it's a cycle. There's a lot of things we don't know, but the more we do research, the more we know about these interactions, the better the tools can get. And that's why it's great that Ulrike Kress and the, um, the um, Academic Advisory Board of the KMK is pushing them to really implement such a cycle in these uh, centers that they're planning, because otherwise we will never benefit from the research insights in reality. And without reality data, we can never really get insights into the kind of um, foundational issues that we're interested in. All right, thank you.
Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, very detailed comment. On, you share the effect size, and I think that's, of course, quite important. Um, and it was actually quite high um, from what I saw in the Coins D. Um, when we talk about learning, right, and, and education, it, what what is the norm that you are expecting when we talk about pre-GPT or pre-AI kind of learning models and the effect size you might expect there versus uh, AI-induced kind of learning, right? Do you, do you see a difference in magnitude or expect that? No, that's actually a very good question. And in a sense, my answer to that would be the highest effect size you see is with a pre-AI, it's called human intelligence. <laughs> so uh, the highest effect size is basically humans tutoring individually, um, a, a human, and that's in a sense the gold standard. And now then the question was always, um, what, how close can we get? And there is an interesting dispute because um, 20 years ago, uh, kind of Carnegie Mellon and colleagues, um, so people from Carnegie Mellon and, and some other colleagues, they um, claimed uh, that you can basically, with um, machine tutors, so a classical AI-based tutors, you can get up to the level of human, human interaction. Um, Kurt von Lien, in, in particular, has an interesting paper there. Um, then others said, no, that's not true. And there is a paper um, by Draxler and colleagues in Germany who, uh, who um, emphasized the point that just by having a tool, you're not having any results at all. What you need to ask is, in which way was it implemented in, as part of the learning context, how was, for example, when I say, did kids actually submit their homework late? Did they pay attention to the accuracy of their submission or did they just try something out wildly and so on? These kind of things you can imp um, have impact on through instruction. The teacher, how the teacher introduces the tool has impact. So I think right now, the, um, the conclusion um, in the field seems to be, at least the way I perceive it, is that the tool by itself cannot be judged. You always have to judge it as part of an implementation context for whom is which kind of support with which kind of co um, context um, effective in which way. And uh, there, I don't think we will see a difference with pre um, large language model AI and post language model AI, but we have to ask ourselves is what mechanisms does it support? And mechanism, for example, for um, uh, large language models is the quality of generated language is very high in terms of language. Uh, so if we want to do language teaching, we can now have subtle differences that we generate and discuss them, at, for example, in the Oberstufe in Germany, in the um, higher levels of the high school. It's a marvelous opportunity to um, um, enable people to do critical, so metacognitive, metalinguistic skills. It's just an unbelievable tool for that. And it's very clear that it's much more problematic if people don't know what they're doing, just like if you have an, um, a spell checker. And a word spell checker, turns out there's a lot of research on that because it has been around for a while. It is not an effective learning tool. Why? Well, because if you know which option to choose from that it's offering you, then you have the knowledge, it's just a slip, it's not an error, it's not a competence problem, so you not have, don't have, a, you have an attention problem, you don't have a problem of learning. So just like there, if you give ChatGPT to young children, the quality of what's produced will so much awe them that they will not know, they cannot evaluate yet what it is that they're trying to learn. So I think, for me, the difference is not in quality of um, you know, effect size, what it will do later, but in the nature of what you can do and who can deal with it well. And I think if you have high level of expertise, it's a magnificent tool that will, much better than in the past, generate a wide variety of well-formed language and for context where that's valuable, like uh, Oberschule, high school, um, upper level high school teaching, that will really make a big difference in the amount of effort needed by the teacher to produce this. But I think for lower level, more practice, um, introducing material, practicing, there will not be any advances um, compared to classical AI because the curriculum is model, needs to be modeled anyways. So we will not get around the job of modeling what it is we're trying to teach. Um, and so that will be, I think, will not be impacted as much by generative AI. Yeah. I see too many questions for the time. Maybe uh, you all ask something. <laughs> yeah, okay. But Peter, then a short question, and, and then we can do everything else during the reception. Yeah, thanks, Ned. That was nice, nice journey. And, and you started the journey with uh, talking about the hybrid AI systems, right? Rule-based and, and, and generative. And my feeling was that the systems that you reported on lately, a feedback and so on, 
are mainly based on rules, right? So the teacher mm -hmm. put in the feedback and also the things like input enhancement, prepositions and so on, uh, syllabus. It's mainly rule-based, right? So where's the avenue for, for hybrid? It's a mixture. So for example, in order to highlight um, prepositions or things like that, you use tools, for example, power of speech taggers and dependency parsers, which are trained. So mm -hmm. uh, yes, there were, was a time in the end 80s, uh, no, end, end 90s, where we had huge grammars um, covering you know, all of English, all of German, and that's something we also worked on in Tübing. The problem with these things is they're too brittle. So um, going only rule-based, I think, would be problematic. Um, but the reason I think you perceive it as rule-based is that we always reify the category. So, for example, a preposition or um, you know, another language property, we always want to identify something rather than end-to-end -end training. Mm -hmm. So uh, large language models, you typically have end-to-end -end settings. You want to say, um, yeah, classify or whatever. And where I think this hybrid nature will go much further is also as soon, uh, as I mentioned, for example, we find a text, then through the re-ranking and whatever, which again is, by the way, um, yeah, statistically based. Um, and then uh, if we generate questions, there, in order to generate well-formed questions, you would be a fool not to try to use um, a kind of large language model based. It is, you do pre-training, you take some pre-trained system and then train it on you know, fine-tuning, as you know, or different ways, reinforcement learning. So the idea is there you should go hybrid, but um, for a purpose. And I think the important thing is let's not take the tool, let's say what we want to do. And for example, in this case is let's generate a question on the text that the student has, um, has chosen by themselves. So it needs to be automated because the teacher is not there. What's the tool of choice? In this case, clearly um, machine learned, uh, so large language model. But if you know it, if you know the regulation, if you know um, prepositions, phrasal verbs are a problem, you would be fool not to put that into the system. Why discover it uh, through 10,000 learner interactions that, oh, you know what? They have problems with phrasal verbs. Well, yeah, any teacher can tell you that, right? Okay, I would like to interrupt it here. Many thanks for this talk. We have seen there are more questions. Um, but there's also sparkling wine outside, so that we can toast on your start here and also at the closing of the Human Agent Interaction Network, there are also some snacks. And then I hopefully see you all at six when we have this panel discussion on the impacts of ChatGPT and similar tools on individuals and society.
Hvordan? Ja, das doch, ja. Okay, welcome everybody to the last part of this day. So for the ones who now joined only for the panel discussion, we had already the whole afternoon celebrated the closing of the Human Agent Interaction Network and welcomed Detmar Meures as the new professor. But so far we had a lot of scientific talks and poster presentations. And now we wanted to broaden this a little bit and have a discussion on the impact of ChatGPT and of course all these other related technologies on individuals and society. And now we also have a professional moderator, so I don't have to do so much anymore. And I will hand <laughs> over to Eva Wolfangel, some of you, so she is not only a moderator. You might also know her as a journalist writing, for example, for the Zeit, also a lot on these AI topics. I've seen you've also been a member as a panel on similar panels, but I think that's even an advantage. So I give the floor to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, sometimes I, I can't uh, hold myself from giving comments too because, yeah, <laughs> I do write a lot about AI and research. But yeah, today we have four fascinating panelists, so um, I'm sure they have many more interesting things to say than I do. Let me quickly introduce them to you. Um, we, I start with Peter because he's just a local. <laughs> he's from here. <laughs> oh, it's not only a local, of course. but <laughs> So he's a professor of, of empirical teaching and learning research at the University of Tübingen and head of the Multimodal Interaction Lab at the uh, Leibniz Institut für Wissensmedien, I, IWM. How do you say that? Do you say that? Uh, IVM? EVM. Um, um, he's interested in... Um, the design and optimization of innovative digital learning opportunities, sensor-based real-time assessment of learner, uh, learner states, like, like working memory load. This is really interesting for me as a moderator too. Sometimes Maybe I need to be a test person at some point. <laughs> and the use of AI in educational context, which is a, a big topic for tonight too. So welcome, Peter. Um, and now this is just how I have written it on my list. Um, on the other end, uh, from my perspective, we have Sarah, Dr. Sarah Fischer. Um, she works as a project manager for the project Reframe Tech, Algorithms for the Common Good at the Bertelsmann Stiftung, as I heard. We have to say it in German. It's, even if you speak in English, it's Bertelsmann Stiftung. Um, she's responsible for supervising the scientific studies, and she's currently focusing on the topics of AI skills and trust in human technology interaction. And before that, she completed her PhD in the group Trust and Communication in a Digitized World at the University of Munster at the topic of trust in online health services. Welcome. Great to have you. Um, and here we have Anne Scherer. She uh, founded Delta Labs, which is um, um, AI... I forgot what the English word is. AI consultancy. <laughs> Sorry, we, sp we spoke too much German today already. <laughs> um, so she's an um, experimental innovator and an expert on consumer psychology and technology. Um, and before she founded Delta Labs, she was an assistant professor at the University of Zurich and served as a global future council for the World Economic Forum. And, and she has um, written a book, um, a bestseller called You and AI, or co-written the book, You and AI. Welcome, great to have you with us. And then now only Leo is missing, Leo van Waveren. Um, he is together with Peter in, in the project Network on Adaptive te Teacher Training. Um, he conducts research in the field of computer science in the working group for, and now I, I try to translate Fachdidaktik and <laughs> failed <laughs> didactics and technology, as, as he told me, is maybe the best translation. Um, at the uh, Technical University Kaiserslautern Landau. Um, and he trains vocational school teachers and is working a lot around technologies in educational context too. Welcome. Um, we, we thought for tonight we would roughly discuss or three, uh, three, have three blocks or parts of the discussion. We would start with using um, AI and especially, of course, um, JetGPT or generative AI in our everyday lives. Um, we would then move on to the, the broader societal perspective. And as the third part, we would like to discuss if we prepare people um, 
in the right way to, to this future and what do we need in order to, to have a good future with AI or maybe we don't, as we discussed now, maybe AI is just get, getting worse again and we don't have to just deal with that. But now it looks like we have to um, discuss how to prepare people um, for our future with AI. So let's maybe start with just a short round about your personal um, interaction with AI, chatbots, generative AI in, in your daily life. So what do you use these tools for? Who wants to start? No, it, I think not. I, I think when you when they gave them to you, they were working. <laughs> no, I know. Okay, maybe I spoke too much already, and now you can't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is technology and people interaction. <laughs> so much. Is it? Is it working now? Okay, I just have to go way closer. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Okay, going back to your question, sorry, that was kind of uh, all the way somewhere else. Um, so uh, I think uh, all of us use AI on a daily basis um, if we want to or if we don't want to, right? We like to watch the weather forecasts and all that, so I do that. <laughs> um, I have tons of conversational interfaces at home, which I like to use uh, simply because I am doing tons of stuff and I want to have my hands free, so I use Siri and I have an Alexa and all that, um, which is very convenient. And uh, in the last one and a half years, uh, JetGPT has become <laughs> a very important part uh, for me and my daily work routine. Um, especially uh, since we founded Delta Labs last year and we're a small startup, so we have to be very, very efficient in the things that we do. Um, we're still a very small small team and having an AI tool that helps you write your marketing materials, your uh, LinkedIn posts, um, helps you do brainstorming. So you have a, like your personal assistant and partner with you. Um, our CTO is using it to program more efficiently and all that. So for us, um, especially going into the startup last year um, with ChatGPT coming out uh, at the same time um, has been a tremendous time saver. Um, and we can do so much more um, with it, uh, just you know, implementing that into our daily work. So, yeah. So what, for example, is it doing for you? You say generate this social media post for me, or what, for example, are you doing with huh. Uh, tons of stuff. So almost anything that is related to writing tasks, translating, um, but also brainstorming and using it for open um, prompting, um, generating ideas for workshops, generating ideas on how to structure things, generating ideas on, you know, how should I structure this document? How do I write, you know, a project offer, which I've never done before in that context. Uh, so we do anything uh, just to brainstorm and have that partner and then write individual texts um, more efficiently. But also analyze data, we've, we've tried that, um, yeah. Um, it's also very good with language data, obviously text data, um, to get some keyword extracted um, and all that, and that is extremely helpful, so yeah. Great, thanks a lot. Who's next, Wait, Leo? Picking up on that, um, of course I use the navigational system in the car as well, which is based on AI, so um, AI, it's not a question whether it arrives in our society, but it's already there. And Let's maybe it, speak rather about generative AI or the AI latest type. <laughs> generative AI, and um, apart from the already mentioned uh, translational help, spell checking and so forth, um, it's a tremendous help if one is writing a recommendation letter for an American university and they are usually using these um, superlatives and he's the greatest student and that's not the way I write in German and it's not the way um, we usually would uh, write German recommendation letters and uh, to bridge this cultural gap it's at least an approximation sure you have to read it once again but okay uh, that's how you phrase it uh, you get an idea and um, getting these insights it is a helpful tool it's rather hard the other way around, right? If you want to write a German-style email and it's just always so polite and so nice and so many words before you start with your the thing you wanted to say. <laughs> That's what I experienced. Sometimes it's, it, to me it sounds like if I write in German email, ask ChatGPT to write in German email, it sounds like just a translated American one. Like, ich hoffe, diese E-Mail findet sie gut. 
<laughs> yeah, but for Americans, it probably works. <laughs> This is AI-generated content. Take a stance on that um, is something that wouldn't be possible. So we can provide new learning tasks. That's really interesting, and I think we would discuss this in more detail in the next round. Yeah, thanks a lot, Peter. The microphone work? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. So when you when you mentioned that you want to ask how you use it privately, I, I, I recognize I don't use it a lot. So I started actually privately like five years ago with GPT-2 with the kids on a farm and vacation, play around writing stories. And I found some remarkable metaphors that the system produced and I immediately started a project within this MIE network on creative writing and finding out how good these texts are, how believable they are, how creative they are. And I'm still working on that. And and I did some private experiences on that, so writing some songs together that took unexpected routes, and so it's really interesting. But I never get so much hooked, actually. And recently, uh, with a PhD student from Berlin, he's also here tonight, um, we started to work on academic writing, which is more difficult because, I mean, narrative writing, creative writing, songwriting, is not about truth. It's about narration. So you can write those. So there's no problem with hallucinations. So that's an interesting area, I think, to use it. But in academic writing, of course, if you write scientific papers, it's more difficult. But we found, or Nicholas found in, in his studies, that people really improve after they have experiences with using ChatGPT for writing scientific parts, like a one grade level in one hour, uh, rated by professional graders. So that's quite remarkable. But personally, I never used it for writing. I once wrote an essay in the early days of GPT-3 where I was still struggling, have I, do I have to cite it as an author or have it to footnote? I used to, was, I did nothing, I just wrote it because, I mean, yeah, it was, and I asked my colleague with whom I wrote this together whether he could recognize which part were from the GPT-3 and which were from me, he could not recognize, so I just said, <laughs> but after that, <laughs> but after that, I never, I never really used it for the parts that I write because there are too much, I think, yeah, theory parts, discussion parts, are very much about going deeply into the matter. And, and, and yeah, GPT in a raw form just has a lot of platitudes, a lot of yeah, superficial stuff. So yeah, now we are working uh, with, uh, with many people from Tübing now to really use it in an educational context, helping teachers, for instance, come up with good questions, good quizzes, uh, things like that, that really are a bit deeper into the topic that really address difficult aspects of, and that's really work. I, you, you can't just open GPT-3 or GPT and then ask, give me a question on, on optics, and it gives a good question. You really have to prepare it, you have to customize it. So that is really the work we are doing now. And maybe if you customize uh, this uh, interface, maybe it's going to be better, and maybe I'm, someday I would, would use it also professionally, but up to now I, I don't do it. Sorry. Uh, no worries. I'm you said so many that. interesting things for the next round, so I just noted everything. So yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot. Okay. Well, with um, algorithms in general, I'm definitely with the navigation now ones because my sense of orientation is just very crappy. Um, so there, I, I totally rely on them. Um, and uh, with uh, ChatGPT, um, I agree agree with uh, Peter. Like for complex topics, sometimes. Um, well, very superficial, um, so I use it more often to like polish my language in the sense of, well, please um, make this sentence a bit simpler, or please um, rephrase it more concretely, um, or searching for examples, uh, or finding headlines, for example. Out of curiosity, because we had a discussion on ethical behavior earlier today, and I was wondering, do you refer to ChatGPT with please? Uh, I guess not. Did I say that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. I do, because I heard it, it works better than, but not because the people. <laughs> <laughs> Information by ChatGPT, right? <laughs> be polite, and I will be better. <laughs> so, yeah, but I'm not sure if I would do that without that in mind. It, it, this is just what I, my experience, right? If you are nice and say, well done, thanks a lot, that really helped me a lot, it's much more open to 
help you again. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> But that's a good question. I, there was was some research um, around um, earlier stages of of, of um, how we how we talk to robots and um, our, how we uh, we had this in, in our um, coffee break how we uh, sometimes beat up robots. But <laughs> but but even how we talk to conversational as um, systems before they weren't as good. It's that people start to speak louder and have shorter sentences and more like this comment thing. So they they handle them like like slaves sometimes. And the question from this um, scientist was, um, if this uh, what he said, they see that this changes how people talk to each other too. If they talk too much to mm -hmm. machines, and that's interesting. That's another reason why we should say please, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, Peter, you said. Um, in the beginning, with GPT two or three, that, that was very creative, um, and now it's. Would you say ChatGPT is not as creative anymore? So in the beginning, uh, with GPT two, I mean, it was on the farm, and I, I, I we, we created a crime story with the children and started with uh, the farmer is going with his truck to the Güllegrube. I don't know the word in German, uh, in, in English. And then he continued, um, and he started to barbecue his sausages on the intestines of his truck. Er grillte seine Würstchen in auf den Eingeweiden seines Zulasters. And, and I thought, this is an interesting picture. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I just saw how he opened up his truck with a hot motor and then the um, engine, and then he would, would uh, barbecue his sausages. And then I googled that and found that it was not uh, something stolen, that it was something invented. And then I thought, okay, that is really stimulating. And in the early in the early days, we did some studies with uh, people from the German literature archive on on AI writing, and came up with um, continuations AI continuations with poems from famous uh, poets poets, and they were really interesting, uh, strange metaphoric. Um, uh, expressions there, and then I th at that time I thought that this might be interesting because it gives you some strange ideas on how you could work with words and how you could continue with things like songs or so. And then GPT-3 became very, very um, clean and tidy. And uh, GPT-3 was, was writing like a, like a drunken clochard. And GPT-2 uh, was, was writing like a Finanzbeamter nach Feierabend. So that was... And then I thought, okay, it's over. But I mean, it, it recovered a bit from that. And, and then we started to interact uh, with ChatGPT, saying that, yeah, I think Uwe started that thread, give me a winter poem, and 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 you think it's too cliche and too kitschig, and then maybe get a little bit more sh uh, schroff, and then do it in the style more of more dark, like Kafka, and explain me why it's like Kafka, or do it like Rilke, and oh, it is with how the unity with the universe. And so it could talk on the meta level about that, and I don't know why that becomes more creative. I, I think it has never been as creative in the sense of that you have some associations that fit, but that are novel and that are for you a bit strange. In a way, I probably Kai would say we had this project together now, how to align these parameters, the temperature and things like that, that you get some ideas that are beyond your usual associations, but still interesting and relevant for the task. So. I don't know. We have a, a big, a large project started just weeks ago on this issue of how creative that might make you uh, to interact with with a specific type of of AI. But I, I have to um, I th I think we have to s strengthen Detmar's point. It's not the technology; it's how you use it, how you adjust it, um, how you align it with your other task. So saying ChatGPT makes you creative is a, is a nonsense uh, sentence. I would say. In fact, you, you said something uh, about a study when we were discussing this this panel, right? That that showed that individuals can become more creative, but the whole group um, rather not. <laughs> Looks like we have we mixed up female and male usage of microphones. Is it better now? <laughs> Put it off, or <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we had to change too, but we don't know why. It's, it's for Sorry. the best outcome. So what? So um, and this leads leads maybe to the to the next um, round. So what what do you all think is most promising when you think about um, use cases for these generative AI, 
chatbots as well as I don't know if you work with image generators too. What what do you see as promising for maybe not for yourself but for teachers we had or for students or other other people society? Uh, what I found pretty interesting was um, the opportunity to um, promote and preserve um, national languages of countries. Um, so I found an example from Mali. Um, so the case is that um, last year um, the official language, which was French, was removed uh, by the government. And then, well, the teachers, for example, had to um, well, create materials in the national languages of Mali. And um, there has been an... Um, a government-backed initiative um, called Robots Mali, um, and they um, created a machine learning data set with the national languages, and then the teachers were able to use ChatGPT um, to build, well, yeah, stories, books, um, worksheets um, for the students, and I think that was a very nice example of how these technologies can be used to well, promote those languages. That's interesting. That means they made their own data set and then they could produce things they hadn't had before because uh, the local language wasn't as strong as French. Is that what you said? So they could produce books they hadn't had before in their... Yeah, yeah. They hadn't... Well, they didn't use them because... They hadn't, um, them, they hadn't um, them because um, French was the official language for schools so they only had materials in, in French. And um, actually um, for... Um, so this had another positive effect um, not related to technology because many um, students um, dro dropped out of school because it was so hard to learn um, in another language um, and French is I, I guess a very hard le uh, language uh, to learn in um, so um, yeah that was another positive effect that, that they well, um, could use their own languages um, to, to learn and um, yeah and that was also supported by a technology for creating the materials. That's so interesting because I think we, we, we heard the opposite too, right? That people said um, with the generative AI and chatbots, English is becoming even stronger and small languages will, will die out even faster because, and this is I think what we all experienced, even in German, ChatGPT is not um, as nice and as eloquent as it is in English. And of course, for small languages, this is much more the case. So that's interesting because that says if we invest as a society we can stop this or maybe use it for for the opposite yeah great example thanks it's the same with well information like um there's also an initi initiative um called Letema, which is also called the black gpt um which um yeah put a lot of um information about uh black heritage black culture black experience um um yeah in like as a basis um, so that um, also this information is included um, in the data set. Um, so, yeah, if we like, we have to put in an effort to make um, the, the data more diverse um, and include several perspectives to counteract this focus on English and on, on white culture. Can I just add one thing? I think um, actually adding to that point, I think one could actually argue that these models are helping um, living in Switzerland, I mean, we have three official languages and that's always a problem at the university in communicating. So the, the deal is that at the University of Zurich, communication is in German and in English. And you're simply neglecting the French and Italian part. Uh, but now with these models, it's a lot easier to generate the same text in three different languages simultaneously and you have everything ready and go. Uh, you can post it. So that could actually improve the way that we communicate in all these different languages. Yeah, that, that's very really interesting. Yeah, if we just think about what what other use cases we could we could um, produce. Yeah. Uh, well, um, one additional advantage, if we ignore for the moment potential drawbacks, um, is that uh, this can serve as uh, an equalizer. Currently, um, well-to-do kids have access to a private tutor. They get support in learning environments and potentially. This is a tool that can serve for disadvantaged youth uh, from a lower socioeconomic standing to have access to tools that teach them in an individualized manner that support them throughout their learning journey. Um, so this is something that wasn't feasible before. Ideally, this will help reduce a gap. 
that you are skeptical about that, or what is? <laughs> because this is something we hear a lot, right? That this is. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, um, we ideally can use it um, to free up working memory for um, higher processes, keep uh, redundant tasks to a minimum level, and um, have them work on real improvements. What can happen is, um, before I was giving out a task, give me 10 pages till the end of the term. Theoretically, I can do this, give me 10 pages tomorrow. Those who do not have access to these models will fall off a cliff. Um, if I start inflating my requirements, um, the advent of AI will lead to a situation all those that do not have access to these models or do not have access to good models will face an insurmountable um, challenge of keeping up with the expected pace, um, similar to um, the questions asked in A-levels. Um, as soon as um, calculators enter the picture, uh, we uh, step up the requirements of the questions. So if these tools are um, accounted for when I put out the task, I implicitly require the students to employ these tools and implicitly require them to have access to those. So that's why I'm a bit skeptical if we do not take care of this factor as well. And maybe it helps to know how they work, right? This is something I observe a lot, with, especially with students or kids who are using ChatGPT and they just don't know, for example, that hallucinations happen or that they just make up sources and just copy and paste them in their homework, which is, or, of course, a problem. Or it's cited definition by ChatGPT in the... <laughs> Can I add one more point to yes, this? Yes, please, you can um, always Because uh, um, I heard something very similar regarding to uh, academia and the research papers that we write. Because here also you, you may have read about the papers that readability is an important aspect of getting your papers published. And most of the things that we publish are in English, and most of us are not native English speakers. Um, so at the moment, the situation is that you can either afford a good lecturer, somebody who goes through your paper and corrects for it, or, and this is my hope, since you're also developing this, <laughs> maybe we have you know, a large language model that is good in scientific writing, and that would also democratize this access of getting papers published, because it shouldn't be about you know, how well you can communicate, but about the content, what you do and what you do research in. And my hope would be that this is also something where um, these models could actually help. Yeah. And <clears throat> something about the... Um uh, potential for education because there's like um, an example from Australia which I found pretty interesting um, that they built an education app on ChatGPT but they um, limited um, the questions the, the pupils could ask only to educational um, contexts and they also um, I don't know how they did it but they um, adjusted the system um, as such that it didn't like write whole essays or give like um, a very extensive answer, but rather um, with short answers and um, further questions to the pupils uh, to prompt them into critical thinking and um, developing the, the answers on, on their own. So that I think that was a bit, um, yeah, um, um, a very clever adoption of, of the system for educational purposes. So as you said, it's more than um, like a tutor helping you find the right answers. That leads us back to Peter, and I wanted to ask you, you mentioned something that students learned to write better academia papers using ChatGPT, or how did this, this collaboration work between students and ChatGPT? This is a study that was run by, by Niklas, who's in the back of the room, and he had a design where uh, students had to write an essay is a small introduction to an essay, like, like a page or so, a theory part of a, of a paper, that should um, integrate three papers they read. So they read three papers on a topic, and then they had the task to design a new 
uh, study and write a paper, an introduction to that new paper. To to, uh, and they did this three times, the three different topics. And they did it first on their own, then with ChatGPT, then without ChatGPT again, in an academic writing course at the university. And the basis was that they did some research around yes. what, what research they, was they, done. They read three papers, they had an hour, they read three papers, and they came up with an idea for a new study in that area, and they had to write the introduction to that new paper. And then um, what he found was uh, basically that the texts written with GPT were very much better than what the students wrote with regard to um, readability indexes, uh, 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 yeah, computer linguistic markers of, of text quality, coherence, and so on. Um, and also afterwards, the um, uh, yeah, professional uh, teachers uh, rated, give, gave grades for that introductory, and, and it, students went from three 0.0 to 1.9, so more than a, a grade better. But the interesting part, and, and of, also the readability, because it was just the, the topic that you mentioned, was uh, remarkably good, and the distribution was remarkably sharp. So all the texts were exactly the same good quality, not the distribution that students usually have in their, in, in their quality. And then the third text, and that is the interesting part, when they used no GPT, but they wrote it on their own, but they have seen how GPT had done it, they do it on their own for a new topic, uh, they were also significantly better on all measures. Uh, coherence, uh, readability, but also grades. There was actually there were one grade better in, in, the, ra in the rating than their first attempt uh, within one hour. So that seemed to me remarkable that you can have an intervention that students learn in one hour to go from a grade three to a grade, grade two text um, production on a scientific issue. So that I think is potential. But of course, you are completely right. It's not the tool itself; it's how you use it. And that what uh, Niklas, of course, is now studying. Do they just copy? Do they think? intensively about it but it can provide you in a way with a worked example you know your task has come up with a, a page of uh, theorizing on that topic and then you get exactly an example of how that could look like or one or two or three or four examples how that could look like from GPT and you get a concept of how things look like an introduction is in, and I think this is very helpful from an instructional perspective if you get some on target, on topic worked examples for that. But there's a specific use of, of the technology, right? If you just use it to produce your homework, it will not work. But that means they, in the end they just need a good example of how the outcome should look like? Yeah, and it's probably not enough to just get any example, but how would one have a good example if one reads this three texts to come up with a new introduction, uh, one page with this structure, integrating this three texts, and then you get an example of exactly that, what you've been thinking about on your own. It's, it's not, yeah, now I show you some introductory part of scientific papers on different topics or integrating different texts. So it's very much on, very much focused. I think this is an interesting potential. Or another example, oh, no, I don't give another example. So, <laughs> <laughs> so interesting. <laughs> uh, otherwise, Marcus is switching off my mic again. So, <laughs> But uh, to come to your question, uh, what, what are the potentials? I mean, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I, let's, let's, let's talk, speak more about the potential, but maybe the other ones want to say something. I would like to hear this other example too, but let's maybe just make another round. Well, um, it brings us back to ChatGPT provides us blueprints, but the quality of the blueprints may vary wildly and depend strongly what we put into it and um, in which use cases uh, we try to employ them. So again, it depends strongly on the context. So maybe uh, adding a little bit of context, uh, since uh, um, we just started with the startup, we get a lot of insights what industry is doing and what they're requesting. And um, one of the key areas at the moment for companies is in marketing. Marketing is a lot of you know communications. There's tons of frequent customer requests um, that are always the same. Uh, it's very time consuming and very expensive to answer these. Um, if you do that with a call center. Um, so all of these uh, use cases are at the moment very early on where they started um, you know, trying out how to use these models for customer support with chatbots, but also internal chatbots for having an internal Wikipedia chatbot, um, but also for marketing communications, product descriptions, uh, product images, um, and all that, and hyper-personalizing language, text, and uh, images uh, to the context. 
Um, and there's lots of uh, interesting ideas at the moment floating around um, doing that. And um, especially bigger companies, but also media companies are uh, the ones that have been uh, testing a lot very early on in the last year. But isn't that the most, um, how do you say that, the, the easiest idea or the, uh, that's but at least what I observe, right? Marketing or um, press releases. I, I receive a lot of press releases and I realize that many of them are AI generated now or with the help of AI and I find them very boring. Isn't that, isn't that the yeah. big problem that it's just that's, boring? That's, and that's a good thing. The most boring tasks are the prime examples for AI. <laughs> this is where humans are not good at. When yeah. tasks get very boring, it, you know, you have a high turnover, people you know, don't want to do that job. Also in a call center, you talk to angry customers. These are jobs that nobody wants to do. So this is a prime example for AI. <laughs> But in the end, if the result is still boring, is maybe we don't need those things. <laughs> Some people like to read them. So. <laughs> I'm not, I, I don't read them. I just want to say. <laughs> you have to have them. So. <laughs> Somebody tested how good AIs are in calming down angry customers. Oh, huh? There is uh, one study on how empathic uh, the responses are perceived. Um, and they had a blind study between the responses of JetGPT, I think it was 3.5 versus um, personal, and uh, a JetGPT outperformed. It was uh, rated 10 times higher in empath empathy. So <laughs> it excuses itself all the time, right? Well, again, it's, it's, it's the comparison is humans that are stressed out, that do not have enough, enough time. So they also looked at the kind of answers, and the answers from humans were a lot shorter to the point. Do this, 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 this. ChatGPT has all the time in the world, right? You know, it doesn't matter. So it, it, the, the model repeats, oh, I'm so sorry, does you have this and this problem. Obviously, people feel that this is more empathic, and that, that's the difference. I would explode if it starts <laughs> rum <laughs> rumbling around. <laughs> well, um, I was talking to a telecommunication uh, company, and their AI department use it, it, uses it in customer uh, support. Uh, they get lengthy emails, eight pages long. My internet connection is not working because, because, because. And... Uh, tone it down to five bullet points, tell me what the customer wants <laughs> and um, provide me with an uh, empathic answer and well they have to reread it again but um, apart from uh, empathy uh, the system has patience mm -hmm. so the 15th angry customer will get the same patience Someone uh, who has just been yelled at may not have the energy to muster otherwise. Well, we are working a lot with um, public and ad administration and there are also similar cases. Like for example, many cities have chatbots so that um, citizens can ask routine questions 24 hours a day. Um, because that's what they used to, like getting answers quickly and... Um, And um, it's also like um, AI has the potential or it's, it's the huge promise of AI for public administ administration um, to take over routine tasks. Just well, um, the lack of skilled workers will um, be a huge problem of public administration. Um, and well, they have like automated um, some of their processes, for example, um, with... Um, um, child um, care benefits you have to um, hand in um, study certificates twice a year and um, where people had to um, check whether all the information is correct um, and it was very time consuming, so consuming and so now um, there is an AI that scans the study certificates and looks whether it's the right certificate the right name, the right term um, and the uh, employees just have to do an end check and they save a lot of time. And um, it's also used, for example, to um, will help uh, citizens fill out applications. For example, I don't know, applying for dog tags or something like that. Um, so it's, yeah, um, well, in the interaction with citizens, but also in the back office for public administration, there are various um, well, uh, examples where it's very helpful. At the same time, this is one point where we remove friction and at least we believe, believe this is an advantage uh, 
but uh, if I re uh, remember back then, um, elderly people entering into a doctor's office, never meeting the receptionist, just sitting down, talking to other patients, waiting for them to enter, and uh, having scheduled appointments would remove this um, window where they can meet each other. So we steer into a future where everything is optimized for efficiency or perceived efficiency. Uh, the marshmallow test appears to imply um, there is a benefit of waiting and at the same time we are feeding this immediate gratification monkey with here's your answer, here's your appointment, here's your answer. So we remove something that has been part of how we uh, live together without having a clear idea where this leads us. So not everything, optimi not always is optimizing these points of friction uh, without drawbacks. Have these chatbots who are very patient and <laughs> write about many pages, <laughs> but yeah, no, <laughs> I totally and get your point. <laughs> I would like my answer from the public administration quickly as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we see that in the work context uh, as well because, um, well, I find um, like um, an example of the. Um, how do you call it, Federal Agency of Labor, um, very striking. They um, had an AI um, that took over routine routine questions and um, processes, uh, which left um, the employees with the complex tasks, which were also like uh, having to do with yelling uh, clients. And um, yeah, they had like the whole day complex uh, issues um, to do. Um, and they... Um, yeah, couldn't handle it. So it, they stopped this process um, to take a step back and um, look at how they well, could have this balance of doing routine work for just like getting your, well, giving your brain a rest and um, then, well, having the, the um, capacity to well, do po complex tasks again. So you need both. I totally agree. That's so interesting. That means... Again, and again, we sometimes forget some things, right? Or we oversee some aspects of our life, and in, 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 in the idea that we want to optimize everything and use the time perfectly and effic as efficiently as possible. That's really interesting. Um, and we already see these effects, right? I just want to um, what, what Leo said. Um, I had an interview a few months ago with a researcher, a psychologist from the U.S., and she's measuring attention spam, and she's, she says it's um, attention spam is just going down and down and down and down, and I think that's one of the effects. And maybe it's not a big problem, but um, maybe we miss it. Or I, I mean, at, le at least I hear people complaining about that, right? Including myself, honestly, that I cannot concentrate long enough on, <laughs> on things. Or tr tr you can check yourself, watch a very old movie, and put your phone and everything away and, and, and test yourself if you can do that. Um, I tried that once and old movies move on very slowly. It's really hard not to grab your phone and do something different while you're watching. So. The physical results of a YouTube video loading three seconds long has the same <laughs> biological response to watching a horror movie. So people really get stressed by not having immediate access. And it is notable, notable for websites who try to sell things, Amazon estimated, having the page loading one uh, second longer leads to a measurable significant loss of trades because people get exasperated with waiting and um, in the classroom, we need this time. We don't take the first pupil raising his or her hand to get the answer because in the meantime, something still happens in the heads of the other kids. So there is a real point in having this delay and as you mentioned, attention span quickly dwindles. It's also an interesting question um, to think about what will happen to our autonomy and our um, ability to make decisions. If there's, like, for example, with ChatGPT, always someone we can ask and we can refer to and, like, maybe also delegate um, decisions. So that will also be an interesting point to look at in the future how how this will develop. And if it, if these decisions, at at what point they start not to, f if they feel like they are your decisions, that's something I find really interesting when I was thinking about. Um, 
biases, or maybe we can go to these points now, even after all this fun and, and optimistic perspectives. <laughs> um, when you think about these biases, um, which are, of course, in, in the systems, and, and we saw that in generative AI, it's, it's even worse, right? That there's even a stronger bias, and it's even harder to, to deal with it or to re remove it or these, these kind of things. Um, And, we, and then there's always this when we ask, um, so isn't that a problem if whatever public administration is using AI systems to decide about whatever, um, about the freedom of the, of, of the people in the end, right? Or about um, things, um, socialistung, and what's the word for that in English, social services. social services. And we had examples already, right, where systems decided um, wrongly and there was just a, just just a bug and people didn't get um, their money and, and I think in the US even some people committed suicide because they just couldn't live without that money and, and only afterwards someone found out that there was a bias in the system. Um, and then people always say, well, this is, there's always a human in the loop, right? They, they find out, um, they, they, do, they decide in the end, it's not the system, um, people decide. And I was wondering, isn't there a point where these people maybe think they decided it but in the end they are nudged um, to decide in a, in a certain way through these through these systems, because of course it's always the notion that computer systems are that, that they don't fail, that they I mean they compute, they should they should that should be true. So this is maybe something for you, I guess you. Uh, well, there's a phenomenon called automation bias, which um, says that we humans um, tend to overtrust. Um, technologies and tend to uncritically use the results um, and there are like various examples with ChatGPT there's been for example a lawyer in, in the US uh, taking ChatGPT <laughs> to um, well, for, for finding precedence um, for a trial um, and then it turned out well they didn't exist at all um, and would have been way easy for him to Uh, to check it because there's the database in the US uh, where all the judgments um, are, um, are listed. Um, and we also find it with um, like pilots um, relying on, on automated flight uh, systems, but um, also with um, there has been a research with the um, police in, in Great Britain, Britain um, which used um, like facial recognition to identify um, suspects. Um, and it turned out that they hugely relied on the on the um, system and gave it higher credi credibility rates um, without well checking um, if it was true. Um, so yeah, and it's like um, happening in 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 well um, in areas where it can have um, like high impacts on people's lives. So what is the solution? I was really wondering because we know about these biases and, and the only answer you get most of the time is there's a human in the loop but then we know about this automation bias so what is the solution to not use the systems for certain decisions or what, what, what would you, how would you solve that? Well, on the one hand, like you, um, I think you can like train people to to critically um, well, think about the results and also use other sources to, um, to check them. Um, so you have to like, um, um, well, make conscious their role in this process. Um, and it also helps if they have to justify um, their decisions um, and well, why they um, chose the decision of the, of the system. But um, well, yeah, it's actually pretty hard to um, well to um, overcome this bias. Um, so that well, maybe it's it's the right answer that in in critical areas um, you you just um, yeah can't use it um, if um, there's no human oversight of it. Can I just add one point? Because I think I mean this is a very common discussion, and I. I always like to point out that, I mean, humans are biased too. And that, so what is the alternative that we're talking about? The alternative are biased humans. And I mean, this is where the models learn this bias from. <laughs> um, so uh, 
obviously we want to have models that are better and not biased and then have systems where you know humans at least critically reflect um, at a minimum to see you know if this is a good decision i think a key problem so i've done tons of research on trust in ai and a key problem um, that we usually found is is what you mentioned that people have an inherent lay theory that AI or machines in general are more objective and neutral than humans. And they're often very, very unaware that they have a bias because they were trained on bias data. Um, and even if there's an interesting study from Stanford, for instance, coming out, uh, came out a few years ago on HR decisions, um, and they gave them the exact same decision. One was given by a human, one was given by an AI model. Um, and they were both discriminating, uh, same decision. Um, the problem was that people did not perceive the recommendation from the AI model as discriminating. Um, and this is something that we have to work with, that people become aware that these models have bias as well and then critically reflect. Yeah. I mean, that's maybe, that's maybe a good, um, um, good way to our next round because both of you said it's about training people, about literacy, right? It's like like AI literacy. So are we training the people um, the right way right now? So what, what would you say? Maybe this is a question for the two of you. Two again, is, is this... Um, so what, what do need, people need to learn? What skills do they need for the future? And are we, are we on a good way? Or are we training them exactly the wrong things? You're on a bad way and, and for years. I mean, the problem is not new. The problem was also is, uh, do you, are you able to use Google in a, in, a, in a rational way? Or do you just click the first link? Are you able to uh, understand social media? So it's just the next round of, of this AI-generated information. And what we know is that people do not recognize it. I mean, in our own experiments, we have really a 50% chance of recognizing an AI text and saying, this is AI, this is human. And the metacognition is 75%. So if you ask them, 50 is, uh, I, I just guessed, and 100 is, I'm sure, then they say 75, and since five years. They did it for GPT-2, they do it for GPT-4 uh, again. They, they it means we know, we think. We think we know it, and we don't know it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. yesterday I read, uh, I read a news in the Hochschullehrer magazine, a study from Bavaria, uh, where they studied how students and uh, pupils used GPT, and they found that over 50% did not know that GPT can uh, uh, hallucinate, can, can, can say wrong things. I mean, that's in the news for two years every day, and they don't know, so we are really wrong in educating them in that. How can we change that? What do we have to do? I mean, the problem is if we, as long as we think we know it, that's even harder, right? Because it's then we don't harder. start to learn. It's <laughs> so what concepts did you see? Or what would you think? What, what should we, how should we train people to, to deal better with this future? But I think to start with, um, like, a, like a basic competency um, people need is like a realistic concept of these... Um, um, of these tools, like to um, see that it's a tool that we humans um, make use of and not um, an independent agent having magical um, possibilities or capabilities. Um, so that would be a, a good point to start with and like knowing about, on the one hand, um, about the realistic potentials and on the other hand, also about the limitations. So where um, are the limitations of the systems and what are um, unique um, human well, competencies that have come, um, well, have to be there and have to um, be enacted in the interaction with those systems. Um, and then um, I think, um, well, we did a, a study with um, 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 a scientist um, from the public administration uh, science and an AI expert um, defining... Um, or competencies for the public administration sector um, when interacting with AI. Um, and it's not just technical skills, um, but, for example, organizational skills, um, but also communicative skills, like explaining the work with AI, um, or, for example, um, so society-related skills, like thinking about the ethical impl implication, but also these personal skills being open to... Um, the technologies and also um, 
well, knowing your own role when interacting with them. So having like um, a reflected interaction. And thinking of professions, what, what kind of professions do we need in the future? Or what? I mean, I, I was just wondering, do we still need teachers? Because you said this AI tutor is, is helping everyone. So maybe this is something AI, AI can do for us? There's no AI tutor yet. It's just future vision, right? Uh, that's one thing. And the second part um, maybe ties a bit into your f uh, question uh, before. Um, if we're looking at the society now, it may be a bit harsh to judge them how much have we advanced because um, ChatGPT has been around now about two years. And we still have teachers who completed their teacher training before smartphones were around. And we have ideas how to include them meaning in a meaningful way in the classrooms. And this took us uh, about 15 years. So um, yes, we're slow uh, with adopting things. And I'm with you that we're not in a good state right now. But um, the timeline is very, very short, and this won't be the last disruptive technology arriving. So um, hoping that we equip them with the knowledge to uh, work with the tools may be um, too short-sighted. We need them to be equipped to deal with change, and um, this is something um, where I believe you cannot um, replace a social process with a technical one and that would be my reasoning why yes we need teachers we can supply tools to them but teachers do more than uh, implant knowledge in the heads of children and hopefully yes. uh, <laughs> if that was their sole role maybe an ai system can take on this role but some teachers define themselves that way right they think they just put knowledge into the brains of the kids and maybe those teachers would be replaced and that would be good for us. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. well, um, w most likely lawyers will get replaced by lawyers working with AI and not lawyers will be replaced by AI. Public servants won't be replaced by AI but the work will be enhanced and I think the same will be true for teachers. Teaching practices solely relying on um, hoarding knowledge for future use won't be um, a way forward. Uh, may still happen. Uh, some people will go into the future screaming because fax machines are dying out. But um. <laughs> I mean, that's, by the way, another bias, right? That every generation thinks of themselves they are living in the fastest changing times. And, and now we think, and I hear this all the time, Never, uh, never before things have changed so fast, and uh, maybe that's not true either. <laughs> um, oh, it's exactly seven. That means um, the plan was to open for the audience at, at seven, and luckily, and that right now I see the clock. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to open the discussion for questions from the audience, and as long as you think, or is is already someone is there a question already? Feel free to ask. And I don't. Is there a microphone for the audience, or should they just shout? Okay, there's someone. <laughs> someone over there. Oh. Ah. <laughs> um, I have a question. Well, in addition to the, the bias problem, I mean, of course there are data biases, but I think there is also something like a, a zeitgeist bias, if you, if you will. Like... Um, thinking that the world would be best if it worked um, a particular way, like saying more market-based, for example. Um, do you see a risk that um, these zeitgeist biases are also um, cemented into AI and uh, that we have a hard time getting rid of them? And if so, what could we do against that? That's a really interesting question. Leo, you have... Like uh, I would say for sure, if we have a look at um, how Western uh, moral has evolved in the last 50 years, we currently 
take at least a strong viewpoint towards the rest of the world in certain areas, uh, equal rights and so forth. Not all of them have been around in Central Europe for very long. Uh, training documents predominantly is in English and therefore mostly from the Western world and therefore influences um, which kind of responses these systems will produce. And most likely um, the next generation will produce values building upon these from which they stem. But uh, we currently have... Um, a part of America with a very different vision of the future. And should the next election go one or the other way, most likely training material from America will have a different zeitgeist. Um, I just had an idea. Um, there's even now, I, I had a discussion if, already a few years ago with, with someone about the idea of fairness and that even this is of course different across cultures and that it's, um, if you want to use, I think the discussion was about how can we make sure that AI systems um, have more fa fair outcomes, um, again, around this bias topic and then someone said, well, um, we as society are not even um, sure what we think about what fairness is or what, what, yeah, how this should be. That's something I found in addition very interesting to your question that um, not even the past has maybe different zeitgeist or different um, cultural um, ideas or ethics um, or morals, but, but even different countries do have. And this is, of course, something deeply baked into AI systems and the training data too. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks a lot. There's another question in the last row. I actually want to share an example as for why to some people AI is actually the abbreviation of anonymous Indians. <laughs> because uh, there was a story that Amazon used to have an online uh, supermarket called uh, Amazon Go or something like that. Yeah. And they claimed that uh, those supermarkets are run by nobody, uh, not nobody, but like they run totally autom automatically, so that there will be no cashiers. And the, the way people uh, get charged is that they put uh, goods in their shopping chart, but the shopping chart has a camera to uh, using computer uh, uh, like vision, uh, computer vision techniques to identify what kind of goods are you purchasing so that you'll be automatically charged and there will be nobody uh, engaging in such a process. But actually, Amazon is crowdsourcing and having people from India or uh, Philippines to uh, manually check those pictures so that they see what kind of goods they are purchasing instead of using actual AI techniques. So somebody is actually arguing that AI is actually an abbreviation of anonymous Indians. <laughs> uh, but my question is that I think it's actually an example that how, like, like uh, under the context of such techno technological development, it's actually somehow enhancing uh, global inequality because it only means that still those uh, people from less developed regions all over the world are doing the jobs uh, which are, you know, the lower end jobs, but still those high tech companies are just uh, uh, taking themselves as an overarching status in such a global, uh, how to say the global uh, working quality uh, di distribution, right? So, what do you feel about it? How how do you look at it? Do you think AI is actually helping uh, the world to be maybe a better place? Or AI is actually only enhancing global inequality? I'm sorry, the question is a bit long. Yeah, you're right. Right now, it looks like it's it's doing the opposite, right? We can discuss fairness as long as you want to, but you want to say something? Yeah. I'm a bit pessimistic in this regard because the entry hurdle into the market is severe. Um, in the early days when ChatGPT wasn't that big, they claimed around December 22 
um, that they have server costs of around a million a day. So there aren't that many companies around that can foot such a bill. And when Fei-Fei Li at Caltech um, developed one of her models and looked for labeling her data, she employed 60,000 mechanical Turk workers. Um, solving captures uh, yields about 2,000 captures for one dollar. So um, the global north uses um, currently labor which it acquires through um, difficult means um, to uh, fuel the current AI hype and um, the gains are exponential. Um, this is not something of, okay, we are two years behind, but we are several generations behind. And closing this gap will be really, really difficult if we do not make a conscious effort to close the gap. Again, we have the potential, but we need to make deliberate decisions. And this is uh, ties into what we heard earlier. Um, we may incur um, a penalty for making a moral decision here. Yeah, I mean, we as society have to invest in these in this fairness in the end, right? Because as, as you said, OpenAI pays a lot on whatever servers and everything. Um, but yeah, poor them, they don't have money to pay their click workers in, in a uh, good way. We all heard this story, um, or maybe you heard the story, right, about people in Kenya who try to um, help open AI to that their systems are less, don't, don't um, spread hate speech and these kind of things. And they had to read and see hate speech and other um, pictures and, and articles the whole day and yeah, were really traumatized. Um, and when I was speaking about that with Meredith Whitaker, who is um, a US tech ethicist, I would say, and uh, I always said this kind of things, but can't we as society decide that we do it in a better way? And she was, um, like you, very pessimistic and said, well, so uh, history shows us that we just don't. So that's really a question if we can change that. Doesn't it mean that we should focus on really important, useful users of AI? I mean, personally, I think education is really an important field for that. That can improve this adaptivity, personalization, these things are really interesting and, and, and severe problems. Whereas I think yeah, personalized marketing campaigns to op optimize profit for me are less important worldwide. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that, that means if, if it's a, a difficult business that costs a lot of resources, that, that raises un, uh, inequalities and so on, it's important that we use it for, for, for important purposes, I think. Uh, if we but does it mean regulation? Should, we should make regulations that... But I mean, I'm totally with you. I don't want to have this marketing emails anymore. I really don't need them. <laughs> we, we, yeah, but maybe. But that's what people say, but in the end, they usually do want it. <laughs> that's also a problem. But I just wanted to add, when, to your point, yes, I think then we would have to have regulation because otherwise you will never have people going back if there is an opportunity to benefit. Humans are inherently greedy. You will find that person that will use it for whatever use case if they can benefit from it. So other yeah. other than using regulation where this is you know clear... Well, you are right, and it's also not specific to AI. I mean, in the EVM, we had this discussion since 20 years uh, when EVM started, uh, social media started. We said, wow, social media, great, democratizing, and everybody can contribute, and Wikipedia, and great stuff. And then, yeah, it ended up in what we have now, in the social uh, um, girls do suicide because they look beautiful enough without Instagram filters and so on, and political campaigns and so on. So, the, the, I mean, people tend to use, some people tend to use this in a bad way. And, and the, main, in, the main stimulus to do it is because it's a financial incentive. So YouTube was the same, okay? What a great resource, and it's mainly bullshit. I mean, if I watch my children uh, watching YouTube, they, the gradient goes down and down and down. You couldn't expect it can be worse, but it can be worse. So because it catches attention, and attention is the money that they... So, yeah, regulation. Well, be, maybe we can't solve everything at once, but 
one area where we can make a deliberate decision could be, for example, education, because it is already highly regulated. We have uh, requirements in place which books are allowed in schools. Germany takes a very harsh stance regarding advertisement in schools. So having a model that is vetted for what goes into it, um, that relies on a data set that has been looked at at least regarding biases and so forth, might be a way and uh, a school book is less complex than uh, a book on the subject matter uh, in the um, library and is even less complex than a book at university level. So it may not be state of the art, but it may fulfill other criteria and maybe we can add ethical criteria to that list in selecting which AI tools we allow for educational purposes. Um, but, um, yeah, we may need regulation in this regard. Sounds like this is a long way to go here. Yeah. Are there more questions? And there's one. To the issue of regulation, I wonder though how one would regulate it. And I think uh, Peter mentioned something earlier about um, reminds me of a signature of a colleague of mine. What are the important problems, and why aren't you working on those? Um, so, um, because in a sense, what happens right now is if we drive development based only on commercial principles, it will not solve any of the problems we have. Like, look at the last PISA um, survey in education and the first PISA survey. We've had not made progress; it's gotten worse. And that after all the data that we've got. So don't you think that we then as a society, in terms of regulation, need to define goals? You know, what do we have? We have climate change. We've got societal heterogeneity problems, education, um, traffic. There are, these are well established. And they, we, we didn't, I think the problem is there's a lot of demonstrations, you know, Fridays for Future. But there's very little effort in terms of using methods that we're talking about here AI to solve the problems we actually need to deal with. So, but the big question then is, what does it mean, regulation? Um, you, so you mentioned uh, something about school books. School books currently have to be in some states, not all states, have to be approved. When I suggested that the government actually require that we have adaptive tools supporting these school books, they said, oh, we can't do that. The school book publishers would never allow us to. Right? So I think um, where is the right knob that we can turn to actually ensure that the problems we have to solve as a society are actually dealt with with the, the tools that currently are developed solely for commercial purposes. So I think there's a total disconnect there right now and not seeing how we can deal with it because when I was a professor in the US, the problem is there you could still use and develop tools. That is over. Unless you have massive commercial power right now, these tools that we're talking about will not be kind of optimized and they don't. we don't even start. That's the problem. I see. So where do you... How can we, regulation is not enough. We need to define goals. And how do we connect those to the development of the methods we're talking about here? Looks like we don't have the answer. But this is exactly, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> the problem that Detmar points to is really serious. I mean, digitalization school means you take something for your iPad that is free. And free means it's commercial. Pay with your data. It, it buys your attention. Or if, if, if the Kultusministerium buys something, it is cheap. And cheap means it is bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really a serious problem. And of course, the, the school book publishers, they don't invest money because they don't need to. So it's really a serious problem that we will not get good digital materials in schools, as far as I see, uh, if things don't change. So that, yeah. Well, I think finding the answer will truly be difficult. Um, but if we look at uh, Silicon Valley, they also push for regulations um, because they assume everything that is not forbidden is allowed and they need to do it. So even Sam Altman said, give us regulations. Zuckerberg said, give us regulations, otherwise we don't have an incentive to do so. So um, maybe um, the resistance is fierce, but um, 
once in place they are willing to play along we see uh, the same uh, with uh, protect uh, data protection they squirm they try to circumvent it but at the end of the day they at least address the issue so um, I'm with you in defining goals and you named a few of uh, the key areas humanity needs to uh, put its gaze on but um, I'm a bit more hopeful with acceptance of these rules uh, <laughs> just real quick um, the other um, argument I heard about why Sam Altman is asking for regulation is because it's expensive for its, his competitors, right? That, that, that makes him even stronger. <laughs> like, it could be a reason too, right? So maybe that's not just altruism or want to be nice, maybe not. Um, which is uh, why I want to add, and, and I think uh, in general we have to think about this whole problem a lot more holistically, not about you know what are our, our goals with AI, but in general, how do we steer our society? Um, and at the moment, we're very much focused on GDP and growing GDP, and it's all towards you know people should consume more, companies need to earn more, so GDP co goes up. So this is what our society at the moment is totally geared towards. And as long as this is staying that way, Companies will try to make money, um, and they will, you know, try to have these models. They will try to have customers on their platforms 24/7, um, get their attention, get more advertisements in. This is what we're currently optimizing for, as long as we have a society that is driving for GDP and growth of GDP. And this is a very general concept that may we all need to rethink in general if this is the right outcome variable that we're steering our society towards. And then we can have a different discussion about AI and other companies and climate change and all that going together. That's basically what I heard from Edith Whittaker when I was discussing with her, why can't we, why is there no hope that we can use AI for the goods she said because of capitalism in the end. Um, but maybe we won't change that tonight. <laughs> but, but we could maybe make a plan. <laughs> ah, there are more questions. Oh, yes, maybe you. So maybe sort of building on this, um, social media and, you know, open AI, it's, it's, it, it is all American, right? Uh, Google, I mean, sorry. Yeah, uh, I am neither American nor, you know, European, actually, even though I, I do live here, um, and it, it doesn't seem to matter uh, where else in the world you are. It's still going to be very much driven by um, AI or tech work generated in, in the U.S. and in North America, fortunately. Um, that just really hasn't seemed to change. Technology has developed in different forms, but the location in itself hasn't changed, right? Um, so what is it actually going to take for the work that we do, or at least the policy recommendations, you know, we might think of um, here at least, uh, could potentially actually drive innovation that gets adopted worldwide, or is that just not going to happen because the trend has been quite set and it doesn't seem like we get to impact, you know, the next uh, big company. Uh, we do get to impact maybe how we talk about it or how it's implemented in education, but we are not seeming to drive what technology comes next. So I wonder maybe you might have more hopeful views on this compared to me. <laughs> hope. Hope, yeah, hope. Uh, hope. <laughs> hope. <laughs> yeah, we had this t discussion very recently when we were uh, starting an initiative in Tübingen for an AI tutor a system with the uh, AI center and, and other people here. And very quickly the idea was the solution would not be like the companies are doing right now in Germany, like, like Phobos or so, to just use GPT, to use an American company and then set on top another company that will provide school contents or something using that in a datenschutzkonform way. Um, 
because we will still completely rely on the, these American business-driven systems. And they can change it tomorrow and change tomorrow. If there's some new zeitgeist training on it, there's some new zeitgeist training on it. So the solution would be, I think, not, and that's what I, what I mentioned when I said uh, digitalization in school means things for free, means you rely on companies that make money out of your attention. So in a way, the solution is not business, I think. It's not the idea... I mean, if you would have a European company like what is the name of the French model it would be Mistral would be probably a bit the same that that you depend on on business interests right I mean in, in the field of education the the regulatory idea is knowledge right it's, it's inside it's yeah um, building and and not money so and you cannot change business systems that are optimized for money I think so I, that's um, yeah no, 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 Sorry, no, didn't work. Hope, but the hope is I maybe maybe the hope is outside of of business. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds like we might need more foundations or or other investments from society for AI for good. This may tie into your point. Um, if we are solely relying on a system that we can use without understanding it, uh, we. The smartphone stops working, I get the next one. Uh, um, the tech stops working, I get the next one. I never need to engage with how is it working. And if we slow down this process, get an understanding what is driving this technology, how can I fix it by myself, I get a deeper understanding of the technology. And by that, I get a bit back of my autonomy because I get a deeper understanding of the systems and that would be a sliver of hope that if we have open source models that can at least hold their ground and um, we steer towards more right to repair understandings, more towards um, maker spaces and so forth, having a, m a more hands-on approach to how we teach the next generation about technology. We can slowly shift things. <laughs> I guess one problem also is that civil society organization um, don't get a say in, like, for example, standardization um, processes it's all uh, like all dominated by um, by the company perspective so um, that would be like for example one opportunity to strengthen um, the voice of these civil society um, organizations so a few years back we also did a media um, um, a study how well AI is depicted in the media and we also looked at which um, actors have a say in the discourse. And there we also saw that like a very positive economic um, perspective um, yeah, was a driving force in the, um, um, in the media um, and civil society organizations were the actors that were um, the, the least present um, in the discussion. Um, and another point is um, that, for example, there is a, a German uh, model like from Aleph Alpha. Um, but it actually has like the same, well, which actually should mirror the, um, was, was said to mirror the European values, but actually has the same problems um, as ChatGPT. So I read that if you ask it, where do women belong? <laughs> it says in the, ki in the kitchen. So <laughs> it like uh, reproduces the same stereotypes. Yeah. I think um, uh, a key problem here is also the way uh, that companies push their products onto the market and here the US has a very different approach uh, still very much. We had the discussion um, in the last years quite intensively in Switzerland. I mean Switzerland has a very good educational system, very good uh, startup scene but they never pushed their products very much onto the market. Starting with a very tiny market uh, to start with is also a problem, but also the investor scene is very different and the way they push their products. If you look at ChatGPT or OpenAI, I mean, what Microsoft is doing at the moment, this is insane. I mean, they're pushing the product into all of their Microsoft suite at the moment. So even if there is somebody who wants to do something, almost anybody's already using Microsoft uh, what, 365 and now they push that 
uh, model into all of their products. So how can a small startup, even if you have developed something, compete against that? That's, that's the hard part. And in the US, even if you are a startup and you're developing, they have huge investment up front and start with huge marketing efforts and they push with a big loss in the beginning onto the market to get adoption really, really high. Um, and then they start to profit. And here, the European scene is very, very different. The investor scene is very different. So they are rather, you know, they don't push as much money onto the market to do marketing to start with, to grow. And as long as that isn't changing, I think it's, it's, it's a hard thing to win. It's a very different cultural approach to building startups um, and getting products onto the market. Now there was one last question I saw. Are there more questions? Oh. Yes, I hope it's, you can end a bit more optimistically. Let's see what you ask. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to, to switch the subject a bit. Um, <laughs> um, so, do you think that AIs may be at, at some stage able, right now they are basically black boxes do you think they will um with regard to yeah critical thinking about um their results will at some point um maybe be able to analyze how they actually got to their own results or um or do you think it will be like well basically with the human mind we're uh Many have read uh, Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, where, where we think we arrive um, logically at a certain point, but often don't. And this question, I think, is especially important with regards to the delay problem, that a claim is easily made, especially uh, by an AI, but if you basically need to debunk it manually and not using an, an AI, there is a huge time gap that can be problematic in itself. Thank you. This fits neatly to what we discussed earlier. Oh, you weren't part of that, but, uh, but, yeah. <laughs> but you, sent, <laughs> you sent me a study that AI is better in fact-checking than humans, right? So that yeah, but that's a different issue. Um, yeah, the answer to your question is no. <laughs> Couldn't we use AI for that? It's impossible to. I mean, it's like you mentioned. I mean, it's a, a rationalization is a good reason, but not the correct one. So it can come up with some idea of how it came up with the a solution, but it will not be in, by introspecting the billions of parameters. Uh, so it's just a very complex function, I think. Can I add one more perspective to this? Because we always feel that we have an understanding of how another human mind works, but it's also a black box. We make tons of assumptions of what other people are thinking, and we have an inherent feeling that we understand because we feel that we understand how we are thinking, but essentially the human mind is also very much a black box. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Just That's what psychologists tell me all the time. People make up explanations yeah. as well. Um, Rationalization is a good reason, but not the right one. <laughs> <laughs> so that to me, that feels like at the end of this panel, and it's exactly seven thirty. Oh, you had a, you had one more question. I don't know. It's oh, I it's just took the mic. <laughs> okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this leads us again, it. maybe back to the to the beginning. That um, the the only solution or way out is is um, teaching people about the nature of AI and. Um, yeah, and maybe not. I think the the problem is if, even if you say explainability, um, people make up explanations too, and AI is, is, does that too. Um, is that that as we had this, this automation bias, right? That people tend to trust uh, machines, and this is maybe the angle where we have to start um, making the world a better one. Just, yes. just adding, I don't think it's enough to put uh, all the weight on teachers. Um, I think. <laughs> Well, that's too late now. I think for today, they, they, of course, it's. I mean, I mean, teaching people things is not only the the, um, the duty of teachers, right? It's all our it's it's our all our duty. You wanted to add something too, because you oh, right, no. just like I think. Well, educating people is important, but we also need regulation on the other side, so they have to go hand in hand. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. That's that was so interesting. I, I love um, that we really talked one and a half hours and everyone listened and closely and I think it was really interesting. I think that they listened. <laughs> <laughs> no another human. I didn't see them read on their mobile phones at least. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was really interesting. It was a great panel. Thank you for listening and for joining us. <laughs>